We got a cat and a dog today. Wow. Oh, hi, Rambo. I wasn't sure if I should replay this whole entire thing because the first hearing is two and a half hours long. Then I looked at these weird statistics on YouTube and over 80% of you that are watching generally aren't subscribed. So do me a favor and at some point in time in the next, like, I don't know, two hours and 45 minutes, if you're enjoying this at all, hit that subscribe button. It really helps me out. If you've already seen the first part and you don't want to watch it, two hours and 15 minutes from now, we will be showing the new stuff. So this is the old hearing coming up. Then the contempt hearing. Do you think dad can follow the rules? Hmm. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, probably about as well as you do. I was going to summarize the backstory on this one, but the attorneys do it pretty well in opening statements. So just to give you the overview, this is a custody case where there was joint custody. Everything was going good. And then one day mom gets a call and there's some issue with dad's house, the condition of it, like it's bad, bad. And also an issue with his brother who the child's not supposed to be around is actually babysitting the child. A temporary restraining order was put in place by another judge. Judge Wolf is hearing that, as well as several motions that were filed by both sides, it sounds like. There's a lot going on. Basically, they're trying to figure out whether they reestablish the parenting plan the way it was before, or, or if they need to modify things based on the condition of dad's life at the moment. This is a hearing on the extension of a temporary restraining order that was issued ex parte. And uh, Mr. Holly, I believe you were the moving party on the obtaining of that restraining order. So you wish to make an opening statement? I do, Judge. Is the rule requested? Judge, the rule is requested. Rule has been requested, so anyone who's going to be a witness in this case must go outside of the courtroom and remain outside of the courtroom until you're called to testify. You are not to discuss the testimony of any other witness with anyone until such time as you have testified. Counsel are under a continuing duty to ensure that the rule is complied with. Now, you now make an opening statement. Yes, sir. Judge, this is a complaint to establish parenting. It's been going on for some time. I looked through the file last night since 2021. I think we need to get at the end of the day, at least a, a date that maybe we can have a final hearing. The situation is I represent Brittany Tressler. Mr. Gerben has filed this action and requested um, that his parental rights be established, which they have been. The parties had a temporary hearing uh, back at that time when it originally was filed in front of Judge Lockhart Mash. I was not a part of that with Ms. Tressler. She represented herself. I believe Ms. Hassel represented uh, Mr. Gervin at that time. And there's a temporary parenting plan in place that the parties have kind of been going by. We've had a few a few issues here and there uh, and some motions have been filed and there's some uh, other temporary orders. One that's important in this case, which is in March of last year, was that uh, Mr. Gervin would not allow uh, Elena to be in the presence of his brother. There was some significant psychological issues with the brother and those types of things. And uh, that was pretty well done, I believe, by agreement in an order. I've showed that to his now uh, counsel. And that's part of what uh, the court will see in this in this hearing. This thing culminated in Ms. Tressler having some concerns about what was going on with the visitation on an afternoon. Uh, she was talking with her child and uh, called for a welfare check. Officer Moss, who has left the courtroom, will be testifying. We'll call him first. He works nights and he's with the city, so he needs to get out of here. He's going to testify that he went over there, that the brother was the only one over there, that he was supposed to be babysitting uh, Elena for, the, for quite a period of time. The house was a wreck. I've attached the photographs that the officers and he took uh, that, that were basically just of a apartment that wouldn't be fit for Mander Beach to live in, to be, to be polite about it. Um, and you can hear from him about what he thought about the apartment when he was walking around and things of that nature. 
the officer Lashley that is going to be the next witness will testify that when he went to go serve the temporary restraining order on Mr. Garvin, that the um, apartment looked a little worse than what the photographs show to the court today and how they went about with, uh, you know, getting the, the summons signed. And, uh, you know, when he left, basically he had to, had to clean off his, clean off his uniform and he's going to testify to all of that. This is not a place that a child should be in. And I know he's got some pictures today that, that, will show that he's cleaned up a little bit. Our position is this has been a cyclical um, situation with Mr. Garvin throughout this entire time. And he's kind of at a low point now. And this child needs some protection specifically, you know, for right now. So uh, when the court's ready and after the opening statements, I'll call Officer Moss. <clears throat> Judge, as you know, I, I don't have the benefit of being Mr. Gervin's lawyer throughout the pendency of this litigation. I'm here today just filling in for Mr. Barnhill, who's sick with the flu. Um, with that said, Your Honor, um, Mr. Hawley's right. The proof is going to show today that, that Mr. Gervin um, has some pictures for the court, the exact same pictures that were taken by the officer that, that entered his apartment that night that shows a completely different living situation it shows a, a cleaned up environment although not perfect uh, substantially better than what the, the pictures allege Judge, I would argue that the the motion itself coupled with the first exhibit which is the report from the officer it makes it sound as though Mr. Durbin is living in something I would describe as an AE's newest episode of hoarders and, and it's really not that bad your honor um, it's not great it's not perfect but I would argue that it, against Mr. Hawley's assertion that this is not a place fit for a child to be, um, Your Honor, I think the proof will show that. You know, I, I, they seem to, to think that maybe this is a continuing problem. Maybe there's evidence that it's been like this before. I don't know. Like I said, I'm just here filling in today. Um, but without that showing, Judge, I, I don't think that continuing this restraining order based on these pictures that have now been kind of resolved uh, would be appropriate. Now, Mr. Hawley has argued that, that protection of the, this child is necessary, and I think this leads uh, to an important point, Judge. Uh, in the motion itself, Mr. Hawley has argued that this is the appropriate venue for this action, and Judge, I would disagree. Uh, they have essentially raised allegations of dependency and neglect. Now, they haven't called them DNN allegations, but they've essentially alleged that the condition that the child was in was in such state of, of squalor uh, that it poses a, a substantial risk of safety to the child. Judge, that, that is straight up an, an allegation of dependency and neglect. Um, and I believe that action should have been filed in the juvenile court, which has exclusive and original jurisdiction for DNN matters. Um, Judge, I, if the court's not inclined to transfer the action or find that the venue is not appropriate and we continue with this hearing, um, I, I would argue that the allegations made are, are now moot based on the conditions of the apartment. Um, I think the, the motion itself was twofold, if I remember correctly. Um, temporary restraining order based on two things, uh, a lack of employment, and bad living conditions. The proof is going to show today that none of those exist. Those have now been corrected. I would ask that your honor set aside the, the restraining order and allow the parties to continue down the path of, of setting this thing for a final year. Well, let me first address the issue of, of your <clears throat> argument that the uh, allegations sound in dependency and neglect, and therefore your argument that this should properly have been brought in juvenile court. Once they, this court has concurrent jurisdiction over matters of paternity actions that are filed, they can file it in juvenile court or they can file it here. Mr. Gervin availed himself of this court's jurisdiction by filing the, uh, actually, yes, he filed the petition to establish paternity. So he brought the matter in before the court instead of going into juvenile court. Secondly, once the matter is before the court, <clears throat> this court has the jurisdiction over the best interest of the minor child. Uh, if there, if I, every time that there's something that could rise to the level of a dependency and neglect petition uh, in juvenile court that's raised in a divorce court, uh, custody case or anything else, which happens routinely, if I then have to transfer it to juvenile court, our whole system will become unworkable. Therefore, this court finds that we have jurisdiction over the matter uh, before us and that the best interest 
of the minor child, which is the preeminent consideration of this court in any custody case, will allow the court to consider the evidence even if it rises to the level of what could have been brought in juvenile court as a dependency and neglect. For that reason, uh, any, any oral motion that I would consider to have been made to transfer this to juvenile court is respectfully denied. We will proceed with the hearing on the temporary restraining order. Mr. Holly, you may call your first witness. Joe Moss, Your Honor. Can you state your full name for the court, please, sir? Officer Joel Moss with the Dixon Police Department. And how long have you been with the uh, city of Dixon now? I can't remember. A little over a year and a half now. Okay. And how long have you been in law enforcement totally? Uh, to include Cratchit's time, a little over uh, <coughs> what, four, five, six years, six okay. and a half years, I'm sorry. All right. And especially during your last year and a half with the city of Dixon, have you had an opportunity to uh, go on calls such as this one where you go out to people's houses and try to resolve situations that are domestic in nature? On a daily basis, sir. Okay. And would you say you've had a lot of experience in those types of calls at this point? Yes, sir. Okay. On January the 27th of, um, and you put in here 2023 in your report, that should be 2024, correct? Yes, sir. I apologize. That, that was a typo. I'll fix that. Okay. On January 27th of this year, 2024, did you have an opportunity to go to the home of uh, Mr. Robert Allen Gervin? Yes, sir. And it says here in your report that was around 1,850 hours. What, what time was, would that be? That'd be around 650. Okay. And uh, that was at 9311 Magnum Drive. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And whereabouts in the city of Dixon is that? Uh, apartment complex down off of Beasley Drive and right. Cowan. And uh, Officer Moss, I'm going to give you the floor at this point. Can you describe to the court, you know, from basically start to finish, uh, when you got there, what, what happened? Who did you see? Who did you talk to? And uh, what condition did you find his apartment? I would need to see my report to reference his exact name, but we uh, got to the apartment. Um, the uncle was there watching the kids and the per uh, dispatch, they had a uh, order saying that he wasn't supposed to have any contact with the kids. And from what he told me, the uh, father left the kid or the child, I should say, with the uncle due to wanting to go out and make money. So if I, and I could give you the report out of counsel, I will do that if you need it, but it was John Gervin, was that the name of the uncle? Yes, sir. Okay. And um, at the time that, that you got there and you're talking about having to go make money, what, what was the purpose of him having to make money on that day? He said he wanted to go, or uh, the father wanted to go out, do DoorDash delivery so he could get the uh, daughter some spaghetti. Okay. Um, was there references that he didn't have money for food at that time? Yes. Tell the court then, continue on. What condition did you find the apartment when you were talking to Mr. John Gervin at that time? Okay, so when we walked in, uh, Mr. Gervin had the stove on because he said his hands were cold and he was trying to heat up the uh, apartment to warm up and also use the stove to light his cigarettes. It was probably one of the most disgusting apartments I have been into in my law enforcement career. There was trash piled up, probably about close to approximately four and a half, five feet high in the closet. There was the stove had trash all over it and dirt all over the stove, which I did include in my pictures. And also, it could be, if you uh, need to see body cam, body cam would show just how disgusting it was. There were bugs coming out of coffee mugs. I'm sorry, bugs coming out of coffee mugs? Yes. Okay. Um, there was a uh, thing of... Uh, ice cream on the counter that was half or that was melted and just sitting on the counter. The uh, daughter's room was trashed. There was trash all over the apartment. And uh, yeah, it was definitely unfit for having a child in that apartment based on what the conditions were. And I did make a DCS referral based on uh, my observations. Okay. Have you heard back from that DCS referral? Have they contacted you in any manner? No. Okay. I want to show you some photographs. Or more to hand those to you. Ask you if you recognize those photographs as the pictures you took uh, on that day. Yes, I do. Can you pick a couple of those out and describe those for the court as to what, what you saw and why you took a photograph of, of these types of scenes in the apartment? Well, I wanted to document just what we saw. So on this first one, you can see mm -hmm. the stove 
And also there wasn't a single clean uh, dish anywhere in that apartment. They opened cabinets up and there weren't anything clean. It was, so you can see on the stove is dirty pot pans. You could, the photo's lousy, uh, or lousy print, but all the markings on there was just dirt all over that stove. So this one, that was the, uh, just showing all the dirty dishes. Trash piled sky high in the apartment. Sorry, trash piled sky high. And we talked to Mr. Gervin about it and I told him, why don't you clean this place up? And he said, well, it's due to a snowstorm, but that's A, a week prior, and B, there's a dumpster right there in the apartment complex that can just take trash right down to. How far away was the dumpster from the apartment, would you say? It'd be walking distance. I couldn't give an exact distance how far it is from the, but easy to walk to. Okay, all right, go ahead. So more trash showing that on the counters. So this one just showed the limited amount of food that was in the cabinet and how there was a thing of cereal and that was it in the cabinet. So it was very limited on food. And the daughter had told me that she had a pizza and a Dr. Pepper and that was all she had. I'm sorry, Judge, I objected to hearsay. May I respond? Yes, a judge. I would. I would first off say this is an 80325 exception to statements. You know, especially if this officer who's uh, uh, set forth the foundation of his ability to recognize these types of things um, as a uh, statement made in a complaint to establish parent as a chancery court proceeding about abuse and neglect. Uh, you know, of a minor child in this situation. Overruled. <clears throat> you can go ahead. Go ahead and finish with your explanation. Yes, sir. So when we asked her what she had to eat that day, she said some old pizza and she had a Dr. Pepper and that was all she had to drink. They didn't have any bottled water or, and apparently she doesn't get water from the sink. So that was all she had that day was a so Holly, one I, Dr. Pepper. Excuse me, officer. Uh, are these the same photographs he's referencing that are in the color of photographs that you had attached to your motion? They should be judged. When yes, I sir. got these from the city of Dixon, uh, they sent the color ones over and I didn't get any other color ones. So I've um, got the black and white ones. Reference, you want to utilize those? I noticed his are black and white. It may be helpful. Yes, sir. I was planning on moving those into the evidence uh, instead of these that he's got in his hands. Show put. those officer to uh, opposing counsel before we go any further. Thank you, Your Honor. I just think it black and white is a little bit harder to see the details. So go ahead. Yes, sir. So on this one now, if you can see on the color photo, you can see clearly how much dirt there was on that stove and mm -hmm. how it appears it wasn't cleaned in a long period of time. And this one, you can see that container of ice cream that mm -hmm. I mentioned that was melted ice cream just sitting on the counter. And this was that trash pile that I was discussing and how high the trash was piled up in the cabinet. Further one showing trash on the counter. Again, they were saying they didn't have money for food, but you can see the empty beer containers and cigarettes on the counter that where if that money was spent on food for a child versus on alcohol, Yes, sir. This one picture shows the trash on the counter and then the very little food that was in that cabinet and yep. not nothing fit for a child to consume for a day. This was her bedroom showing just the amount of trash on the floor in the bedroom. And I had to step around everything to be able to even get in that room. You couldn't see the floor due to the amount of trash. Further trash on the floor in her room. And this one, I want to show the garbage bag just sitting there in the bedroom versus being taken out to a dumpster and more trash on the floor. You said that was in the bedroom? Yes. Oh. Again, a little bit more detail of how much trash was in that bedroom. So this one show 
more empty cigarette containers and stuff like that on the uh, just by the TV versus in a trash bag or and with cigarettes they're e they're easy uh, for her to have been able to get to and if she'd grab one of those it would be very unhealthy for a child for around all that cigarette smoke. Bedroom, uh, the adult bedroom in the apartment showing how much trash was on the floor in his bedroom and also slightly cleaner than the child's bedroom where he lived versus mm -hmm. where his child lives, which I found that that wasn't too uh, conducive to a child. And this one just showing all the cigarette butts and everything else out on the uh, balcony of the apartment. Does that look like a planter, like for a plant? Is that how you found that? Yes. And is that... Would you say that's nearly full of just cigarette butts? Yes. And then empty uh, containers of uh, soda and other trash all piled around it. Okay. Judge, I would introduce that as Collective One to the board. Collective One. All right, Officer Moss. So um, did, did Robert Allen Garvin eventually show up at the apartment? Yes, sir. And your discussions with Mr. Garvin, where where did he tell you that actually he had been? Well, what was his his reasoning as to why he wasn't there? He said he was out door dashing because he didn't have a job, so he was trying to get money for his daughter, or to buy spaghetti for his daughter because he said she wanted spaghetti for dinner. Okay. Um, was there anything else that was said between you and Mr. Robert Allen Garvin that was concerning at all? Well, he told me how he has uh, has had brain cancer and was a veteran. So I tried to give him some uh, pointers on where he could go to, including the uh, VA helpline to be able to get help. I also tried to tell him that he needed to clean his apartment up for her and then take pictures. So that way he could show the court that it was cleaned up, which I don't know if he's done or not. I have, I'm not privy to that. but. So I tried to give him some pointers on what he needs to do to clean up his act. Okay. And when you were out there, what, what other officers were there with you? Sergeant Rapogel and also uh, Patrolman uh, Lefevre. Okay. And is there any question at all that, you know, when you showed up that that was John Gervin that was watching Elena? Not at all. We got his ID. Okay. So at the end of the day here, Officer Moss, uh, how did you leave the situation with Elena apparently there at the apartment? Did she get to stay there? Did you make her go somewhere else? No. What, what did y'all do? Based on the safety for Elena, we called her mom. Her mom uh, responded to the apartment and uh, we uh, brought her out to her mom. And she was crying as we brought her out because she clearly loves her dad, but it just, we couldn't leave a child in those conditions. Very well. All right, that's all I have, Judge. Thank you, Officer. I'm sorry, I didn't catch your last name when you first took the stand. Is it Moss? Yes, sir. Can you spell that for me? M O S S. And you've been with the Dixon Police Department for a year and a half? Approximately. What was the reason for? Uh, going over to Mr. Gervin's apartment that night? We were dispatched because uh, Lena's mother uh, called saying that Mr. Gervin's uncle, who uh, she said had a no contact order with uh, her child, was watching her child due to text messages she received, and she wanted to check on the status of her child. So it was a welfare check on the child? Yes. At what point? Um, in your interaction um, on this night, which I'm sorry, did you say it was January 24th or 27th? 27th. Friday, January 27th? Uh, I'd have to look on the calendar, but I'm pretty sure that'd be a Friday, yes. Um, at what point when you showed up to Mr. Gervin's apartment uh, were your concerns about the welfare of the child the minute we walked in. Well, hold on a second. Were they alleviated on the, the report from the mom? Based on what the mom said, 
we responded, but we always keep an open mind because we get calls all the time. So we have to go in and investigate for ourselves. So when I got there, the second we uh, saw the inside of that apartment, we had major concerns for the welfare of the child. Regardless of any of the uh, court orders on who can watch child or not, it was just based on the, con the conditions of the apartment where brought up our primary concerns. Okay. What all did you search when you got in the house? I didn't search anything in the house. We uh, asked him if we can uh, see if there was food because all the trash on the floor, all the garbage around the apartment that was in plain view from the second we walked in, and we asked him to open the cabinet to show us if there was food or not, so he opened the cabinet. And he also opened the fridge, and there was none, minus those few items I took a picture of. So you searched the cabinets in the fridge, and in general, just the, the apartment itself as a whole? I didn't search it. We just walked around the apartment, just seeing what the conditions were. Well, you, it wasn't you asked him to open the cabinets, right, so you could look inside? Yes, and he complied. Because again, we we're trying to check on the welfare of the child. Would you call that a, a search by consent? Yes. Yes. Because we asked him if we could see, and he said yes. And I, I noticed there wasn't a picture of the contents of the fridge. Could, what was in the fridge? A beer. Okay. Um, there was no food in there for a child, so I didn't even bother taking pictures on the inside. At any point in, during your interaction with, with Mr. John Gervin or Mr. Robert Gervin, um, did you come to find out when the beer had been purchased? No, we didn't. Okay. So is it possible that uh, the beer that you found on the counter that you testified to under direct, I think you said something about maybe their money should have been spent on food, not beer. Um, you don't know when that was purchased, do you? No, I don't, but he said he had, he was thirsty that morning, so he pulled a beer out to have a drink. And was that Robert that said that? Uh, John, John's the uh, brother, your client's Robert, right? Yes. Okay, then it'd be John. But regardless, if you're struggling with money, there are things that you can look at that are priorities over alcohol and cigarettes. Well, now who's struggling with money, Robert or John? Both of them. Okay. Who's spending money on beer and cigarettes? I don't know which one. That's my question. At what point in the interaction did you give Mr. Robert Gervin tips on how to, I think as you put it, clean up his act? When we started talking to him when he got to the apartment. Okay. Is this before or after the child left with the mom? Before and after. Okay. Give me one second, Judge. I'd like to show you some pictures, Officer, if I may. Um, and Your Honor, I'm happy to show these to opposing counsel. I've showed them to him in discussions right. earlier before we started the hearing. <clears throat> I'm just going to hand you my iPad. All right, that's a black and white of the stove. Is this the picture uh, you took that you testified to earlier? Uh, is that the one from my report? You tell me. It it looks similar, but I'm uh, not 100% positive if you took that out of my report or not. Okay. So, as it's just a picture on your iPad. Do you see anything in the corner of that photo here? Please stand at any time. It says filed February. Yes, then. So, this is the picture that was. Judge, I would object as far as the stamp of anything and him trying to authenticate it. Obviously, Officer Moss didn't make that stamp, so he has no way to testify. Officer can't authenticate the photographs, he can testify as to what they reflect. 
obviously they the photographs will speak for themselves, but as far as the officer, he didn't take the photographs if I understand correctly, so therefore he can only observe what's shown in the photograph. He cannot authenticate. I'm not trying to argue this witness more I would also have an objection as to the relevance here. I, officer Moss was there on that day. He took photographs on that day. Now, I understand these are photographs where uh, Mr. Gervin's attempted to clean up the apartment somewhat, but he has no knowledge of any of this. And it would be up to Mr. Gervin really to authenticate every one of these photographs. And I don't think it would be relevant for Mr. Moss to go through all of these to explain photographs of what Mr. Gervin has done after the fact. He has no knowledge of it. Opposing counsel has opened the door to this issue by testifying not only to the, the pictures on direct examination, but this officer specifically gave my client instruction to clean the apartment. I'm just trying to show him the result of that so I can have some follow-up questions on it. But at the same time, we don't know when these photographs were taken at this point. We have absolutely no idea who took them, when they were taken. I, you know, Officer Moss can't testify to any of that as to whether it was subsequent or prior to his photographs. I think we're losing sight of the fact that Officer Moss is not the one who's going to be making the decision in this case. And therefore, it's not relevant, no offense intended, whether he thinks that the uh, apartment has been cleaned up appropriately or not. That falls to me to have that decision. So I'm going to sustain the objection because I don't think it's relevant to have him go through your photographs and say, oh, you know, I think he's done a good job. He's testified what the conditions were. He's testified the advice he gave. The question of whether or not your client has followed the advice or not is a question that I have to determine, not this officer. Yes, Judge. So we'll, we'll just ask it this way. Officer, the advice you gave Mr. Gervin to clean the apartment, I suppose it's hypothetical. Each and every picture that you have in front of you, each and every picture that you took that shows the condition of the apartment as it existed that day you were there. Let's assume for purposes of this hypothetical, none of the trash is on the counters. There's still trash all over the floors though. Let me finish. There's no trash on the counters. There's no trash on the floor. There's no piles sky high as you call it of cardboard trash in no entryway or closet or whatever that was. No trash on the floors. No trash on the stove. The stove has been cleaned of all the burnt food and, and good that you testified to earlier. Had the apartment looked that way as I've just described it in a hypothetical to you, would you have been concerned? Yeah, Judge, I renew my same objection, and it goes to the heart of what the court just said. It's not up to the officer here to give his opinion as to the condition of the house and what that would what that would relieve of his suggestion of what he suggested. This is uh, something for Mr. Gervin and, and his lawyer to take up at that time. I don't think it's relevant anything that uh, Officer Moss would say at this point, and it's based on speculation. Judge, it's a hypothetical. I'm having a hard time understanding why it's not relevant. If he's testified that the condition of the apartment when he got there so caused so much concern that he had to initiate a DCM. But what you're process. asking the officer to say is, is that with the conditions that were there, he found it to be unacceptable. If those conditions were not there, would he have found it acceptable? That's Which exactly is, what I'm asking. You know, that's a simple yes or no question. Was that true? If those, if all of those bad conditions weren't there, would you have had any issue with the apartment? With the apartment itself? No. Thank you, officer. Mr. Holly asked you on direct examination, who were the officers that arrived on the scene with you that night? Um, I heard you say patrol officer Lef Lefevre. Yes, sir. And then you said sergeant, and I didn't catch the last name. Rapolgo. Can you spell that? Maybe. Your Honor, would, can I pull my phone out and pull up the spelling? You may. <laughs> Please accord. It's in the report that's attached to the motion that I think everybody has as well. It's, I'm just a filler. I don't have the actual file with me. So. It's R E P R O G A L. First name Sierra. Repro R E P R O G A L. R E P R O G A L. Thank you, officer. <coughs> you testified earlier that you have um, body cams at, at Dixon Police Department. Is that right? Yes, sir. It's right. right here on my vest. Um, have you reviewed any of that body cam footage in preparation of your testimony today? No, sir. Okay. Do you know if your body cam was operational that night? Yes, sir. All of them were. Um, has that footage been preserved to the best of your knowledge? 
every single body cam uh, video we have gets uploaded onto the system and stays on it. How long were you at Mr. Gervin's apartment in total from the time you arrived, I think you said roughly about 6.50 to the time you left? I would have to see the CAD report to see what dispatch said the time was that we cleared the call, so I don't know. Can you give me an approximation as to what time the mother showed up to get the child? I'd, again, I'd have to see the dispatch CAD report to where it was documented, so no, I can't. How, how was the child reacting when she learned she was going back with mom? She cried. Did she say anything? I don't remember. Do you recall how long mom was present on scene? Long enough for us to check her ID, make <laughs> sure that she was who she was. Talked to her, give her advice because she asked me some questions and we uh, answered them and then she took the child home. One second, Judge. Judge, that's all I have for this witness. Shall I redirect? Um, the court's inclined. May I look at the uh, police report that was filed with the motion? I, I'm going to work on I know opposing counsel referenced that. I'm going to ask him to maybe authenticate what, what he's got there and enter that into evidence. So I'm going to hand you a document and ask you if you recognize that document as your report. Yes, sir. And this is a report that you entered into the city of Dixon based on your communications with the Gervin and at their apartment on that January 27th, 2024 day, correct? Yes, sir. And the only issue with the report, uh, you can look through it, but we've already established it should be 2024 and that would be a change, but is there anything else that uh, you would recant or add to in your report? No, sir. I would move that in as uh, exhibit number two, Judge. No objection being made. Typically, police reports are hearsay and are not admissible, but with the consent of both parties, will allow it to be introduced. That's all I have. <clears throat> Can you recross? Thank you, sir. You may step down. We're releasing you from your subpoena so you can go get some sleep before you're yes, tonight. Mr. Holly, you may call your next witness. State your name for the court, please, ma'am. Brittany Leanne Tressler. And you're the mother of Elena Grace Tressler? Yes. And the father is Robert Allen Gervin, correct? Yes. And you guys are in the middle of uh, an establishment of paternity action here in this court, correct? Correct. <clears throat> now, um, you, you know why you're here today, correct? Yes, sir. Can you explain to the court uh, what made you get concerned that on January 27th of 2024, what made you get concerned enough to uh, uh, make, make the phone calls that you did? Yes, so um, Elena was at her father's for the weekend for his visitation, Tom. Um, she has her own little cell phone. It does not have cell service, but it has Wi-Fi capability. Um, along with this phone, it has an app on it um, called Facebook Messenger Kids. Um, I control everything on who she can talk to, who she cannot talk to, things like that. And she has access to be able to communicate with her father. Um, all messages, anything like that through her phone will notify my cell phone and come through my cell phone as well. Um, I was currently at dinner and a message came across that was a little concerning um, between Elena and her father stating that he, I guess, Elena had FaceTimed him. I'm not sure what was in that conversation in the FaceTime, but the text message that came across was stating 
he will have to wait until I'm done dashing, which kind of concerned me. So I FaceTimed my daughter just to try to see how her night was going. Um, and that is when I was made aware of the fact that she was in the apartment without her father and she was um, in the custody of her uncle who she is not to be around. Good. And did you telephone uh, the authorities? Yes, sir, I did. And you asked for a welfare check, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, so at the end of the afternoon there, did you get a call from them to go get Elena? Yes, sir. And when you arrived at uh, Mr. Robert Gervin's apartment, uh, what what did you observe? What did you do first when you got there? To um, start to finish, what happened? When um, me and my boyfriend arrived at the apartment, we went up the stairs, we knocked on the door, um, we walked through the door. Immediately when we walked through the door, Officer Moss met us and was like, I will speak to y'all outside. We were ushered back outside into the breezeway. Um, from then, Officer Moss, you know, communicated with us, took my ID, talked to us about the state of the apartment and his concerns. Judge, I'm going to object to hearsay. Again, the 80325 type exception, and well, he's already testified to about what he did. <clears throat> At this point, I'm not, at, I'm not going to overrule the objection. I'm admitting it not to prove the truth of the matter asserted, but rather to show what steps she had taken that evening. And it'll be limited for that purpose. Uh, your um, we were speaking with um, Officer Moss. Um, he was explaining us to the concern that he had of the state of the apartment um, and that he believed that it would be best that we take Elena home with us that night. Okay. And in fact, is that what you did? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, and since then, and sitting in here today, you, you've had an opportunity to see the photographs of Mr. Robert Gervin's apartment, correct? Correct. And a little history here with Mr. Robert Gervin. Obviously, you've had a child together. Mm -hmm. Have you lived with him at some point? We have, yes. And for what length of time? Probably about a year, um, fully living together. Okay. Do you, uh, or how do you find, uh, you know, the apartment, the photographs that you saw and the, and the testimony you've heard today in relation to, uh, you know, what it was when you lived with it? Judge, I'm going to object to relevance. I'm not sure what this has to do with the restraining order. It goes to show, and it goes, and I can call her back, I guess it's a rebuttal, but, you know, he's already attempted to show some photographs of we're all better now with the house and the cleanliness of it. And I'm offering this uh, to show that, you know, this is kind of a pattern with Mr. Garvin, and she definitely has the ability to testify to that having lived with it. Well, at this point, we haven't seen those photographs because you objected to them. So I'll have to sustain his objection. It's not relevant at this point. It becomes relevant if and when those other, those photographs are introduced and that the Mr. Garvin were to testify as to changes he's made in the conditions. So, has, thank okay, thank you, Jess. Has, uh, has Elena expressed to you things, again, regarding neglect of her over at the apartment that caused you concern? I wouldn't necessarily say neglect. There has been occasions that she has came home, um, you know, and just in talking with my daughter, um, you know, her hair may be tangly and I'll ask, well, did you brush your hair while you were with your daddy? Um, and there was times that, well, I don't have a hairbrush at daddy's or, you know, her breath might be kind of stinky. And so I'm like, well, did you brush your teeth at your daddy's? Um, and her response would be, well, judge, I don't I'm, have a toothbrush. Judge, I'm going to object to hearsay. I don't think this witness can testify as to the statements made by the child. This is not rising to the level of abuse. So I sustain the objection. So. Let's talk about John Gervin. And you're made aware that John Gervin was left alone with Elena that day. Yes, sir. So from your, again, living with Robert Gervin mm -hmm. and understanding his brother and the things that Robert Gervin has told you about his brother, why is it concerning to you that 
that Elena was at that point around John Gerber? Um, being in a relationship with Robert in the past, um, there was always concern with the brother um, being diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia um, and having some mental problems. Um, even back when we were a couple, that was always you know, in question, um, and it Judge, was brought into question another, again. <clears throat> Judge, I'm going to object. Uh, my objection on this is is going to be twofold. Uh, I'm not really sure um, why any of this testimony about the uncle is relevant. It's my understanding that today's hearing is solely on the restraining order, not about uh, the reasons behind why there's a no contact and why contact with the child is concerning. I, I, I get that that's a fine line, but I, I don't think that that's relevant for purposes of today's prelim. Well, part of the reason the injunction. restraining order was issued was because there was an allegation. There's a court order that was entered in this case, <laughs> and I realize you're filling in, but the order was entered on March the 2nd, I'm sorry, March 16th from a March 2nd hearing. A specific provision of that order is, <clears throat> it is further ordered to judge and decree that the minor child shall have absolutely no contact with John Gervin, the brother of the father. That was signed off on by J. Reese Holly and B. Davis Barnhill. And that was signed by this court, by me. There was a motion to remove the no contact order and <clears throat> that has never been heard. Um, and, and then there was a motion for contempt and for sanctions filed by Mr. Holly for non-payment of child support, apparently. In any event, the motion for an emergency restraining order in this case cites specifically um, the violation of the order by the child being left alone in the, in the uh, custody of John Gervin. It's in paragraph four of the motion for emergency and emergency temporary restraining order. Paragraph four says on the 16th day of March, 2023, the court entered an agreed order wherein the minor child is to have absolutely no contact with John Gervin paternal uncle. And then it goes on to cite the fact that the child was found to be in possession of the paternal uncle with whom she is to have no contact. So it was very much a part of this proceeding and therefore I overrule any objection. Judge, may I be heard briefly on that issue? Pardon? May I be heard briefly sure. on that issue? Well, I understand that part of the basis for the temporary restraining order was the fact that the child was found with the uncle. That's fine, but we're getting into testimony here about the uncle's mental condition, his diagnoses, and what he's being medicated for. I don't think that testimony specifically is relevant for this TRO hearing. I think that testimony is relevant for the contempt issue that I think Mr. Barnhill and Mr. Hawley have set at the end of this month. That's the basis of the objection. I, well, I'm overruling the objection nonetheless because it does lay a foundation for showing why it is important in this witness's <clears throat> mind that the court order be complied with. And that is the reason for, as I've stated, that was part of the basis for the court issuing the ex parte restraining order. And therefore, I will <clears throat> overrule your objection, allow it. But I think she's established why she had concerns, so I think we can move on. So, uh, and just to reiterate a little bit, that March 16, 2023 order, uh, you're aware that was an agreed order between you and Mr. Robert Gervin, correct? Correct. So, as far as concerns around Elena with uh, Mr. John Gervin, what has Robert Gervin told you specifically as to the reasons why, you know, Elena should not be around John Gervin? Um. Robert has told me different times that, you know, there is concerns with his brother, his brother's temper, um, whether his brother, you know, is stably taking his medications and things like that. Um, you know, I've been told by Robert before that, you know, he can't take care of himself. The brother cannot. Um, and that, you know, it's hard to be able, you know, it, it's somehow fallen on him to not only take care of his daughter, but to, I guess, have to take care of his brother as well. Okay. And what, again, um, don't strike that. So was it concerning to you that, that Elena was around John Gervin at that point? Yes. When you saw the photographs that Officer Moss took and that we put into evidence, what concerns you about the photographs of Elena's room? 
not just the trash that was around, um, but it it brought up so brought up questions on how long has his brother actually still been around my daughter that I was not brought aware of. There was men's clothing strewn all over, um, you know the the floor. You know the bed was not made, um, and it appears to look like a bunk bed, but only one bed is made. Um, I can't, you know, speak on what his rules are for our daughter when she is in his care, but with, you know, at my house, she knows if she is not laying in her bed, her bed is to be made. Um, that's how I know the room is clean and, you know, she has done the chores that she is asked to do. You're concerned, you know, you heard the testimony about uh, today from Officer Moss that apparently, you know, John Gervin was drinking a beer in the morning time. Mm -hmm. Based on his, and as you know, and before he testified to his mental condition, does that concern you that he's ingesting alcohol along with Elena? That early in the morning, yes. And uh, you've contacted me and we have filed this uh, uh, emergency temporary restraining order, correct? Yes. What are you asking the court to do today as far as the, the contact between Robert Gervin and Elena? At the moment, I would like to keep it as it is. Um, he is more than welcome to contact me or his daughter and see her at any time if we do not have anything going on as far as a sporting event or things like that he's more than welcome to come to her sporting events he's more than welcome to contact me or his daughter and ask us to meet up for you know a hangout at the park or at burger king or you know anywhere but i feel like for the time being it should be put in place that there you know is visual proof that the brother is not around um and visible proof that you know the apartment is completely cleaned up you know and a better state for her to be able to stay with him and you uh you talk about sporting events elena does track correct i do track and field um she is basically the team's mascot <laughs> so at times has he picked her up from school there when when you're with Elena and things of that nature yes he is you? he has came to Creekwood and picked her up from Creekwood while I'm holding practice how would you or uh, dropped her off as well as far as um Oh, and uh, are you, were you ever made aware that DCS has contacted anybody in this case? You heard Officer Moss make a referral. Officer Moss stated that he was going to put uh, put in the referral, but I have not been contacted by anyone from DCS letting stating that it has gone anywhere. Have you been made aware as a parent that Elaine has been contacted at all? No. Did they meet with her at school? She informed me th um, the next morning after the fact when we were walking to our classrooms, because I work in her school, um, we were walking through the office and she proceeded to tell me that she had been called to the office the day before to and was spoken to by a lady. Uh, and as far as the court, you know, it's up to the court what to do in this situation, but as far as having some sort of cooperation that the apartment stays clean, what are you suggesting happen in that regard? Whether it be, um, whether it be me going to the apartment and physically knocking on the door and being able to step in and, you know, I don't want to look through, you know, his personal belongings or anything like that. I'd, you know, that's not my concern, but being able to walk inside the apartment, if I can see that it is physically clean, then I would be okay. You you heard Officer Moss testify that apparently there was only an old piece of pizza and Dr. Pepper that she had to work on all day. 
Does that cause you concern? It does. Um, it does. Um, I know when she's home with me, I mean, she, she could easily eat me out of house and home. You know, she's constantly coming and asking for, you know, mom, can I have a snack or mom, can I get a drink or mom, will you make me this? Um, I'm pretty sure the child would live on macaroni and cheese if I allowed her to. Um, <laughs> so what, what would you say her hunger level is when she returns from Robert Gerben's home? Um, she typically, as soon as we walk in, she'll ask if she can go to the pantry and get a snack. Um, that doesn't raise much concern. She is a growing eight year old who, like I said, would eat all day long if I allowed her to. Um, so that doesn't, you know, at the time it didn't concern me when she would come home and be like, mom, can I have a snack? Um, but after hearing, do um, officer Moss and seeing pictures, it, you know, kind of threw up some questions on how much did she actually eat while she was with her father. That's all I have, Judge. Thank you. You may cross examine. Mr. Ressler, let me ask, you testified on direct just now with your lawyer um, about living arrangements with Mr. Gerdman. How long ago did y'all live together? That was back in 2020. How long was it for? A year. We were in that place for a year. What sort of... Um, what was Mr. Gervin's employment like during that one year? I'm sorry? What was Mr. Gervin's employment like during that year you were living together? Um, he worked for a company where he was gone for a few weeks and then he would be home for a week. You say he'd be gone for a few weeks. Where typically would he go? Wherever his work was at that point. At like out of state? Yes. Okay. So during the year that you lived together, he was gone more often than he was there. Is that right? Correct. So if he's gone more often than he's there when you live together, if you have complaints about the house being messy, um, really wouldn't be entirely his fault, would it? Well, I don't live with him now, so. I'm, I'm not talking about right now. I'm talking about during the year period that you guys lived together. Okay, well, the year period that we lived together, the house was never in a state like his apartment is. Okay, I, you didn't testify on direct exam with, your, with a lawyer that he had a history of being messy? He I mean, yes, there is a history, you know, but he would never help me clean without being asked. What What would you describe as his messy? Things left out, containers left out, cans left out, clothes not put in laundry hampers. Let me ask you, you testified that you wanted visual proof that the house is clean and that you wanted visual proof that the brother's not there. Um, what sort of visual proof do you need that, that, I guess, John, I think is his name, that John's not there? Well, I would just need to know that, you know, he's, especially if she's, you know, if he's not going to be in the apartment, then he, I would need to know that my daughter is not left with the brother. In our previous order that we are working on now, I clearly, and that we are trying to come in agreement with, I clearly have tried to reason with Mr. Garvin and allowing Elena to be around his brother 
but I don't agree with my daughter being around him unsupervised, given his history. When you say him, you're talking about the brother. Yes. So you're not entirely opposed to the minor child being around the uncle? No, sir. Okay. I, it just does not need to be unsupervised ever. One second, Judge. I think you testified, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you testified earlier that some of the concern you had um, was that with specifically with your daughter's room, there were clothes on the floor and beds weren't made. Was that right? Correct. Isn't that normal for an eight-year-old child, though, to not want to make a bed, not want to do their chores and pick up their clothes? Isn't that kind of normal? Yes, yes. I, there is times that I have to stay on her, even at my house, um, that she needs to clean her room. <laughs> but I can tell her, you know, Elena, like, you need to go clean your room or X, Y, and Z is going to happen, whether I'm taking away phone privilege or... I'm not allowing her, you know, to talk, you know, go to a friend's house or anything. Like she knows that it is expected of her at my house that her room is to be cleaned. Um, and she is very good at, you know, if I notice that her room is clean and I say, Elena, you need to go clean your room, she will go clean her room. But every morning before we go to school, she makes her bed. Judge, I think that the, that's all I've got, Ms. Tressler. <clears throat> as far as her room goes, do you think it's Elena's responsibility to clean up men's clothes that are in there? No, sir, I do not. To clean up trash bags, beer cans, all that, that that's around? No, sir, I do not. Does she have to clean up trash bags and beer cans and men's clothes at your house? No, sir. Are you concerned that, you know, again, as far as John Gervin goes, apparently he's drinking beer early in the morning. And they're all trying to raise money for dinner. Yes. Nothing further. You've seen the pictures that were demonstrated at court, I think. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And I don't know if you can see them when I put them up there. But this is a photograph that was made in an exhibit that shows a shelf where food would normally be. Do you see any kind of food in that photograph? It looks like a hot chocolate box and maybe a box of cereal. And then you've seen what was on the, for example, what was on the shell or on the countertops, which is a apparently empty past, pasta, pastaroni, some empty cans of corn, a melted thing of, of uh, ice cream. Yes, sir. And, and there was another picture, I think, of this. But that is that what you're talking about, your concerns regarding the food that's in the house and what Officer Moss testified about? Yes. Then Mr. Holly asked you questions about the condition of the room and whether, and I think you were asked on cross examination. But are those pictures of clothing that belong to your daughter? No, no, sir. Is that a picture of any clothing do you see of your daughter's in that picture? No, sir. Same picture from a different angle. Any pictures that you see of clothing of your daughter? No, sir. Well, whose clothing does that appear to be? Men's clothing, whether they be her father's or the uncle's. 
I'm okay, not sure. This photograph, do you see any of uh, an eight-year-old child's daughter's clothing in any of those pictures? No, sir. But you understand, is that the the bedroom where your daughter was staying at her dad's? Uh, yes, sir. Right. Anything further from this witness? Thank you, ma'am. You must step down. Charlie, you may call your next witness. Oh, Chris <clears throat> Sergeant Lashley, if you'll come forward. Your Honor, I apologize for earlier. You don't need to apologize. We have this problem routinely with people who are trying to zoom in with us on the phone. Officer, will you say your name for the court? Yes, Chris Lashley. And you work for the Dixie County Sheriff's Department? Yes, sir. And what rank do you hold? Sergeant. How long have you worked into law enforcement? 14 years. And in your 14 years of experience in law enforcement, have you had the opportunity to make calls out in the public for domestic related issues? Yes, sir. Um, and you had attempted on, or you did on the second day of February, have the opportunity to serve Robert Gerdman, is that correct? Yes, sir. And uh, Sergeant Lashley, from start to finish, I'll give you the floor. Can you can you describe to the court what you witnessed and what you observed from the time that you went up to the apartment to the time that you left serving Mr. Robert Gerdman? Uh, when I first got there, the door was cracked. I tried several attempts that day and it was in the evening dark. Uh, the door was cracked open, knocked on the door, knocked on the door. Finally, uh, somebody answered the door. Uh, Mr. Gerber was on the back deck of the apartment. And we have two G Mr. Gerbins here that were going back and forth between he and his brother. So would you be referring to Mr. Robert Gerber over here? Yes, sir. The gentleman in the red shirt was on the back porch. Okay. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Um, so when I got there, you know, finally, I guess it was his brother, answered the door, let me in. Uh, the house or the apartment was a wreck. It, it was a mess. I had seen the pictures that uh, Officer Moss had taken, and to me, it looked worse. Uh, the smell was, it was hard in there. Um, well, I made contact with him. Uh, he come in. I asked him, you know, I was like, you, know, you got a spot to where we can set the paperwork down, sign it. Yeah, and he kind of raked everything off the counters. Here we go, right here. I said, all right. So can you explain it? Raked everything. Can you explain it a little bit? What what happened when you raked everything right. off the counter? The, the counters were covered with dirty dishes. Uh, it, it was it was a mess. And uh, just literally, if it hit the floor, it hit the floor. If it moved to the back of the counter, it moved to the back of the counter. Okay. But uh, he cleared the spot. We we signed the papers and walking out. You know, it, it was kind of aggravated. There's, I guess. I don't know if the gentleman's got a cat. There was a cat on the porch. Walking out of there, ended up with uh, cat feces all over the bottom of my boots. So it's, yeah, it was an experience. And did you pick that up at, at his apartment on the floor? Yes, sir. Just from walking through? Yes. The smell, can you, and not to, not to belabor it, but the smell, can you describe what you were smelling when you walked in? It smelled like old trash like trash bags that hadn't been taken out that's uh, it's dirty dirty that's the best way i could describe it so in your experience in law enforcement and and dealing in domestic issues uh would you have found on february 2nd 2024 his apartment to be suitable for a child to live in no sir if if you had gotten a call on february 2nd there was a child there what would have been your response to that i would have got dcs involved and Probably an emergency removal. That's all I have. Thank you. Cross exam. Sergeant Lashley, did you ask either of the Mr. Gervins about the cat? I did not. 
So you don't know if it was a pet or a stray or anything like that because you didn't have I, a conversation about it, right? I did not. Okay. Um, I asked the first officer that testified the same question, this question I'm going to ask you. Um, if on February 2nd, when you served Mr. Gurman, Gurbin, if there wasn't trash on the floors or trash on the counters or dirty dishes everywhere, <clears throat> If the apartment was clean, would you have had the same concerns? Judge, again, I would object with the same objection I had last night. You know, there's, there's so much. going to speak for itself, but I'm going to overrule and let him answer the question. That would be hard to answer because I don't know the gentleman. I was there to have him <clears throat> sign the papers. What I observed at the moment was unfit for a child. Okay. But had you not observed that, you observed the spotless apartment? Clean counters, clean floors. Not you knowing any tree. situation going on, no. You wouldn't have had the same concerns? Uh, okay. I'll, no. That's all I've got, Judge. No further. further. Sergeant Lashley, you may return to your duty. Thank you, sir. Thank you again. <clears throat> Mr. Lynch. Holly, you may call your next witness. That's our proof, Judge. All right. The movement has rested their proof. You wish to offer any proof in rebuttal? Yes, Judge. I'm going to call Mr. Gervin. Mr. Gervin, if you'll come forward, please. Mr. Gervin, can you state your full name for the record, please? Yes, it is Robert Allen Gervin. Mr. Gervin, I understand you have a, a, a daughter, is that right? Yes, sir. What's your okay. And can you tell the court what kind of parenting plan, what kind of parenting time you get with your daughter prior to this restraining order? I get uh, two days during the week and then every other weekend. I get, well, um, from three o'clock to seven o'clock on the two days during the week. And then I usually pick her up um, on, well, lately it's been on Fridays from three and then I drop her off usually around six on Sunday. I'm supposed to have her till seven, but I always get there about an hour, around an hour early. Okay. What sorts of things do you do with your daughter on your parenting time? So I have short-term memory loss, so it's hard for me to remember what I do. Um, basically, we hang out at the house lately because I've been having trouble making money. Um, and so that's all we've been doing, but usually we'd go fishing. We, we'd go to um, some, wild, uh, some wild refugees. Um, I, I think that's what it's called, like camping sites kind of. But we don't go camping. We just go there. And then we come home. Forgive me for asking. This may just be because I'm filling in for Mr. Barnhill, but you said you have short term memory issues. Is that because of the cancer tumor and cancers? Yeah, they cut out the short term in my in my brain. So I do have short term memory loss. Long term, I can remember things from like five years ago, like as if it happened yesterday. But short term, my memory goes. Is that something that can that get better? Is it treated with medication or anything like that? I take medication, but the medication I take every day is for seizures. It prevents seizures. Okay. Um, are you taking those medications as prescribed? Every day. Up to date, current. Mm -hmm. Haven't had any issues with seizures lately? No. Okay. Um, you testified that, that here lately you've been having trouble earning money or, or trouble working so you guys would hang out at the house. Um, are you currently employed as it stands today? Yes. Okay. Tell the court a little bit about that. No, I uh, got hired a week ago. Uh, last Thursday, I got hired by a place called Midas. It's in Dixon, uh, Tennessee. Um, I had got my first paycheck today. Uh, um, okay. how, much are you, how much are you making at Midas? $15 an hour. And you just started, you said a week ago? Yes. What's your schedule like over there? Right now I'm working every day, usually about 10, 11, sometimes even 12 hours. 
Okay. Um, on average, about 40 hours a week, you would suspect or more? Right now, it's looking at 50 to 60 hours a week. Okay. And do you get time and a half when you work overtime? Yes. If I go past 40, yes. Now you've seen the the pictures that have been shared with the court and entered into evidence. You've heard the testimony. Um, your troubles working and earning money is that the reason why you were having trouble cleaning with groceries? Yeah, same with groceries. Um, originally, I had gotten fired from Walmart for absences when I was doing trying to deal with my brother. Um, so I ended up getting fired from Walmart, and then I figured I'll go to APSU, start school um, with my VA bill, and they would pay me. Problem is, is it was taking too long to get payment from the VA, so I had to quit school and then came back. So I started doing Instacart any way to make money, you know. And uh, the the day that the cops got called to my house was a, a day when I didn't have any money. But before, before all this, these past few months, I was making child support payments on time. My rent was being paid, my electric, my all the bills were paid, and I still had a little bit left over. But right now, I, I went downhill. I don't have much right now. And I'm trying to work to get that back. I'm trying to work to pay everything off. And it's starting to go, but uh, it'll take me a little bit more time to get fully up to where I can and then hopefully go past that and start to reach my maximum capability. So your testimony is that, that these issues were basically the product of a temporary hardship. Exactly. Okay. At any point when Elena was in your care, did you ever let her go hungry? No. If she was hungry, I found a way. Did you, you know, let it, her go thirsty? No. No. If she was thirsty, I would I would scrape every I would get quarters out of my box to buy her what she wanted. The things that she had was the things that she wanted. Not not just leftover stuff. Okay. If it had ever gotten to a point where you couldn't scrape together and make it happen, would you have reached out to the mom for help? I usually did, but they have problems too. My whole family has problems right now. It's very hard to get help. Would you have ever reached out to Ms. Tressler for help? Not with the way that she's been behaving. I Meaning bringing up, uh, I'm afraid to ask for help from, from the mother because I'm afraid I'm gonna be stuck in situations like I am today. Okay. Anything I ask for, I'm afraid it's gonna be turned back around on me. Let me ask you, if your child needed it, child depended on it. If there was no other option, there's I no would. other option. Would you put that aside and ask Ms. Tressler for help? I would. Did you ever have to ask Ms. Tressler for help? No, it always comes at the last minute. I finally get some help. Um, you heard Officer Moss testify earlier um, that he gave you some advice on how to get your, I think as he put it, get your act together. Yeah. Okay. Um, what steps have you taken to resolve some of these issues since that time? Oh, well, I called, he gave me a number. It was a uh, 933. Don't ask me how I remember it. It's just in my head. But um, he gave me that number and I called them and I was put on hold for a while. So I ended the call. You know, I, I, I'm running out of time. So I can't spend, you know, an hour on hold waiting to talk to somebody. I need help. And I can't get help from anybody. There's nobody that is willing to do anything to help me get out of this situation so that way I can go further. It's actually, it's sad to me. I, I, I've applied to food stamps, I've applied to housing. Housing told me I'm a veteran, I gotta go on the veterans list. But food stamps, they, they don't wanna give me anything. I don't know why. I can't get anything from food stamps, I can't get anything from the veterans program. I can't get help anywhere. And I, I, I am trying my hardest, my hardest to do everything I possibly can. And it, 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 it's exhausting. It is flat out exhausting. I have, I have my brother. I got to take care of him every now and again because sometimes he, he forgets his meds. And when he does, his brain goes wild. But he has never been a single harm to any child. 
We had medical reports on that. He is not a harm to a child. And when he thinks he's going to harm himself, he checks himself into a hospital. Um, let's, let's, I don't want to talk about your brother. I, I still wanted to focus on you. Um, is it your testimony that you still need the help you were searching for now that you're working at Midas? Or now that, or now that you're working at Midas, can you afford food? I can. It, it'll take a, a week, but I'll have money to buy food. I'll, I'll fill my kitchen up in a week. Okay. Did you go grocery shopping this morning? No, my brother did. Okay. Is it your, you got paid today, right? I got paid today. Okay. You're going to go grocery shopping today? Yes. After I get out of here, I have to go grocery shopping. Okay. Um, you saw the pictures of the condition of your apartment. Yes, and I, I felt disgusted by it. Okay. You cleaned it? Yes. Okay. Um, Officer Moss testified that he directed you to take pictures to show the court. Did you do so? Yes. Okay. Would you recognize some of those pictures if I show them to you right now? Yes. Second judge. <clears throat> Yes. Okay. A messy apartment. This first photo, is this the photo you were given in the papers you showed them? Yes. What's the second photo there that you showed? After I had cleaned. What does it show specifically? Just a coffee mug and um, this part of the stove top, but nothing else. A clean countertop, a clean stove? A clean countertop. Yes. Is that the exact same picture as before? Yes. Okay. What did this picture do? That is where we had a bunch of cardboard boxes piled up, and then I got rid of them all and I threw them away. What do you recognize this to be? That's the countertop. The, there's a center countertop in my kitchen. I cleaned that off. The floor I didn't get a chance to mop. That's why you see black spots on the floor. Is this like a yeah, like an island. Um, is that the same kitchen island but with trash and groceries on it? That is. Okay, that's now been cleaned. It's been cleaned. And that's an empty cupboard. Um, I need to fill that cupboard. Yes. Yes. Some well, a cleaner stove top. There are still uh, those panels. I still need to scrub those panels. Um, I was actually able to pull it all off, and I scrubbed underneath there. Uh, those those panels are hard to clean. Well, for me, they were. Judge, at this time, uh, because I'm just a filling attorney, I don't have paper copies of these. I'd like to enter these into evidence as late filed exhibits. Fine, we'll let them be marked as a late filed exhibit. Just collective form. Yes. Robert, what other steps have you taken to provide a, a cleaner environment for your daughter? Uh, what, what do you mean? Well, I mean, there's photos of trash in bedrooms. Or I think, uh, as Ms. Tressler testified to, there were clothes on the floor and the bed not made. No, those rooms have been cleaned up a little bit, but I have been limited on my time working uh, 10 to 12 hours a day. So I, I can only get like an hour to clean and some of them were, were horrible and needed more time to be cleaned. Is it your plan to keep mm -hmm. your efforts going to clean the apartment for your daughter? Yes. Okay. Now you were here earlier when the judge was asking Ms. Tressler some questions about the photos. I think the judge held the photos up and you could see them on the screen. Um, the judge was talking about where some of the child's clothes are. Let's talk about that for a second. Um, when your daughter's at your house, where are her clothes normally? They're folded in her dresser. Do they ever go into the closet? No. Okay. All of her clothes. I, I don't have a lot of clothes for her, but the clothes that she does have at my house, they're usually folded up and put it into it. 
or they're in a laundry hamper usually, but I don't, I don't have every day with her. So she doesn't have a lot of clothes and the clothes that she does wear go back to her mom's. So is it your testimony that the, the pictures the judge was referencing earlier, your child's clothes would have been neatly folded and, and placed in the dresser and that's why they're not there? Yes. She's a good girl. I don't. I don't have to. Uh, I don't have to yell at her. I don't have to punish her. Nothing like that. She's a great kid. If I ask her to do something, she does it. She doesn't question. Well, even if she does questions, I can respond uh, to her. I can. I just talk to her, and she pretty much will do what I ask her to do. I'm not. I'm not manipulating her. Nothing like that. She's a good kid, and she's an intelligent, very intelligent, smarter than I am. I never made straight A's. But she has straight A's right now. I usually, when, when she comes home, I read to her. Or I was before. Well, she, she almost outread me. It's kind of weird. Yeah, you heard some testimony from Ms. Tressler earlier. Um, an argument from her lawyer about maybe you being a messy person and that this isn't the first time your apartment would have looked like this. Now, usually my apartment is pretty clean. I do sometimes fall off track and it gets messy and then I fix it. I go clean for a while, then I fall off track. It gets messy. It goes back and forth, you know, but for the most part, I try to do the best I can. And that's normal, would you say? It's normal. I think that happens with a lot of people. You know, sometimes you forget to throw your, your plate away or sometimes you forget to wash the dishes because you've been working all day. You had something else going on that made you exhausted. You heard Ms. Tressler testify earlier um, that she doesn't want to keep your child away from you. That you can see your child as often as you like. She just wants visual proof of some things. Do you remember that? Yeah, I, I, I don't, what, I don't what, quite understand it. What do you... How do you feel about Ms. Tressler's request that she be able to walk around your apartment to give approval on whether or not oh, that would be fine with sufficient. that would be fine with me if I can walk around her house if we, because if we're going to have an even split then if she's going to walk through my house I believe I have the right to walk through hers do you have any concerns as to her house no not necessarily not right now but I'm not walking through her house I, I go in every now and again but even even if the house is dirty I'm not I don't really want to report it. I, I, what I think to myself is maybe she needs help. Maybe she needs a, a I got to hurry up and get the child support so that way she can have help. So in some way I can relieve her of it, not, not punish her, not take the kid away. My kid loves her just as much as she loves me. I don't want to take that from her. I can have all the hateful feelings I want against her, but it doesn't matter because it's about what my child wants. That's what I'm concerned with. Let me ask you, do you believe that's in your daughter's best interest that she not be allowed to see her dad on a regular basis? No, I think she needs us both. Her mom, her mom can be the, the emotional love support that every kid needs, but when she gets older and has to face the real world, she'll need somebody that can push her to accomplish what she needs to accomplish, to be able to face anything. That comes from the father. The mother can support her a little bit, but at the end of it, it's the father who can get a child to do what they need to do. What are you asking this court to do at the end of the day? Well, for this hearing, drop the child order. It was a mistake. It won't happen again. I, I can say that I can, I can get my brother away, but he also can support me too. We kind of need each other. But if, if the court says he can't be around my brother, then it's done. He, he, I'll send him somewhere else. He'll move somewhere else. I'll have to deal with it all by myself. But for this, I, I, I wish this would go away. And I want to get a trial date. So I, I want to settle this, but every, every order I get, it's, it's always somewhere off. There's always some, something that's, that's off. Robert, I don't want to talk about your brother, and I don't want to talk about the, the no contact with your brother. I don't want to talk about the contempt actions, specifically as it pertains to this restraining order. Are you telling the court that this was a, a 
one-off situation. This isn't the normal. This yeah, is the this, department looks like. This is a one-off. Okay. And you're asking the court to dissolve the restraining order and let you exercise parenting time with your child. I would greatly appreciate that. Judge, I, I think that's all I've got for Mr. Right, Mr. Holly, you might cross again. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mr. Gervin, you, you've seen the photographs that we put into evidence that that Officer Moss took, correct? Yes. And with those photographs, you don't deny that was the look of your apartment at that time? At that period of time, that was how my apartment looked. You were living in it. You were living in there. Yes. You, you know that's what it what it was like. Yes. You've heard uh, Officer Lashley, Sergeant Lashley testify that uh, it was basically the same way and that, you know, to clean off a spot, you just basically had to sweep everything into the floor just to find a spot to sign some papers. Yes. And that's accurate. That's the way it was. Yes. Um, where does the feces come in that was all over the floor that he was stepping into? Do you have a cat or a dog? That wasn't feces. I don't have crap on my floor. He got if he if there was crap from his boot, it probably came from a stray cat that likes to spend his time outside. I don't have a cat. I don't have any animals. So you can't explain. I mean, you heard Officer Lashley's testimony. Yes. And you can't explain that, or you won't explain it here today. No, because it's not relevant. That I don't have any animal in my house. So if he's talking about um, feces on the ground, that's not in my house. So you think all the trash and all the things that were going on were appropriate for Elena to be over there? No. What are we talking about as far as the, you heard uh, Officer Moss testify that uh, there, was, there was beer cans and cigarettes throughout the apartment and that somebody was drinking, uh, John had said he was drinking beer in the morning. He did not drink a beer that whole day. Every time my daughter's around, we don't drink. So Officer Moss isn't telling the truth or John Garvin isn't telling the truth? I can't tell who's telling the truth between Officer Moss or them. It, it's, I wasn't there. So uh, John has, you heard uh, Ms. Tressler testify that he has a diagnosis of like paranoid schizophrenia and there's mental diagnosis with John. Is that accurate? Are we here to talk about my brother or are we here to talk about me? We're talking about Elena. Elena. If you want me to answer the question, I very rarely ever do that. You but you understand ask, we're here to. Mr. Garvin, you don't get to ask questions. <coughs> Cross-examination is unpleasant as it may be. You just listen to his question and then you answer it. If uh, you need to make another point, your lawyer can stand back up and ask you the appropriate question. But you don't get to question the lawyer. Yes, Your Honor. So, and you understand we're here to talk about Elena, correct? Yes. You understand the court doesn't care about you, doesn't care about Mrs. Tressler doesn't care about anybody else in the whole room other than Elena. You understand that? Yes. And that's what we're here to talk about. So with his diagnosis, it's paranoid schizophrenic, correct? Uh, schizoaffective is what Judge, I was I'm going to object to relevance. I'm not sure what psychiatric condition of the brother is relevant. And, uh, and Judge, with that said. What we're talking about is a court order. There was a court order. I mean, I wrote down that he said if the judge, if the court orders that he can't be, she can't be around my brother, then he'll make sure she won't be around her brother. It's already been ordered. It has. And, and it was by an agreed order that his lawyer signed off on. So it's already a court order. So I don't care what the reasons were so much as, as the fact that there was a court order down, he either obeyed that or he didn't. And the proof is pretty overwhelming that he didn't. So I, I have to sustain the objection. It's not relevant as to the reasons why, uh, although there is a motion down to relieve that obligation, or to relieve that restriction that has not yet been heard. So right okay. now we're operating under an order that specifically says that the child can't be around the brother and that proof has been that he was. Well, my address, my address court. The, the only reason for the question was so that you'll have some history as to why that came about because that's not in the order. I don't so. need any history. Okay. I've got a court order that's valid on its face and all I need is to know whether or not it was or was not complied with. Judge, may I the reason brief? why it wasn't complied with might be relevant, but <clears throat> right now that's the only issue. So. Judge, may I briefly address the court as well, it not related to the objection? I have got some concerns um, 
on whether or not the court needs to hold a moment's hearing at this point. It's my understanding that there is an, a motion for contempt. I have not physically seen, but Mr. Barnhill has indicated that the, the motion is titled uh, motion for civil contempt, but in the body of the motion, there is a request for criminal contempt uh, remedies with a notice of rights. If there is a motion for criminal contempt, judge pending, then, then the witness has rights, and I'm very concerned that we're floating a line here between his right against self-incrimination and, and not. The civil contempt is what's being sought, but nonetheless, well, we're at the noon hour. We'll take our lunch recess now, and then we'll come back, and over the lunch hour, you can confer with your client and let him know what his rights are, and then we'll come back and get started with that. Yes, sir. Thank you, Judge. One fifteen. All rise. All right, Mr. Garvin, you understand this restraining order we're asking for is, is really based on not just the cleanliness of your house, but there are other things. You talked about being around your brother no food in the home, those types of things. You understand that as well? Yes. So is it common for you to not have any food in your home like that when Elena comes over? No. You know, you heard the officer say that there was discussion that all she had was a old crusty piece of pizza and a Dr. Pepper. Uh, is that common or uncommon? Uncommon. Why was it common on this day when you happen to have the police call on you? <clears throat> At that time, I didn't have the money I needed. You said you were fired from Walmart. When were you fired from Walmart? In the December. In December, you got fired from Walmart? Yes. Why did you get fired from Walmart? Absences. Why were you so absent? Objection, Judge, relevance. <clears throat> well, if Judge, I'm trying to establish, you know, why he didn't have any food in the home. If the court wants me to delve into that, I, I will. If you don't, I'll move on. But I don't know why. That's up to him. If he wants to explain why there's no food in the house, that'll be, he can either answer the question or I'll draw my own conclusions. As far as being, you know, let go from Walmart, <coughs> and you said it was absences. Why were you so absent? <coughs> Do you understand the question? I do, in a, in a way. Well, you got fired for absences from Walmart in December. Why were you absent so many times that it, you know, in their rush traffic where they're looking for people left and right, why is it that, that you got fired from there from not showing up for work? Why were you that absent? What were the reasonings that you weren't there? They, they work off a point system. But I understand, but you didn't show up for days on end at work, apparently, and that's why you got fired. Why were you not at work? Can you answer that question? Not that I can remember. You said there were bugs. The officer testified bugs were coming out of glasses and there were, you know, insects running around in your apartment. You familiar with that? That's due to the apartment itself. There's bugs in everybody's apartment. They've been sending mm -hmm. uh, pest control people out. Why were there men's clothes in, Al in Elena's room? Because uh, Elena, she usually likes to sleep on the couch. So she's, uh, I usually sleep in that room and my brother sleeps in the other room. Your brother's living with you, correct? I'll plead the fifth. And, and just to stay on this line of questioning, your, uh, your brother was there with Elena on that day, correct? I'll plead the fifth. You testified you had short-term memory loss? Yes. You remember testifying to that? Have you, have you had any sort of disability diagnosis because of this? And if so, what was it? The only disability I was able to receive was from uh, the doctor's office when I was just got out of cancer and I was still going back and forth to California to get my head scan. You have any disabilities today that would prevent you from testifying accurately and honestly? I don't think so. Well, that's not a very comforting answer as far as me having to ask questions and the and the judge letting me ask questions. You don't think so or you, you know so? 
I can answer some questions. It just it depends on if I can remember. Again, to to your knowledge, do you have any disability that that would prevent you from testifying truthfully and accurately today? No. And I know the order was done some time back, but just just to be clear, at the at that time, this time, I mean, you understand that John Gerber was to have no contact with your daughter. I played the fifth. You're working at, at Midas. You said you work every day. You talk about like every day of the week you're working? They're closed on Sunday, so six days. Six days, 10, 12 hours a day. Is that what you're testifying to? Yes, when uh, the order came down, if that order changes, my boss would let me go to pick up my daughter and anything I have to do with my daughter, he'd let me off. He's a very, very nice guy. <clears throat> Your brother still live with you? I plead the fifth. You said that you were trying to get help. You know, you testified to the court that Officer Moss had given you some numbers and things and uh, through the Veterans Administration and other places you were trying to get help. And you testified that you tried to call, but you hung up because you were on hold for a while. Yes. Do you remember that? Yes. I remember the tone it played. When, when was that? The, I think maybe two days after. He had told me about it. All right. At that time, you, you weren't working, correct? No, I didn't have a job yet. Okay. What did you have to do that was so important you could not wait to get help? <clears throat> I'm sorry, can you repeat that? What did you do? What, what did you have to do that was so important that you couldn't wait on the phone line to try to get some help for, for yourself as well as not to have this situation that we're in with your daughter? I had to go work doing Instacart and DoorDash. You're going through the photographs, I think, with your with your lawyer here. You testified there were still like black spots in your floor that you hadn't mopped your floor yet. You remember that? Yes. When was the last time you mopped your floor? Yesterday. Were those black spots? And before yesterday, when's the last time you mopped your floor? Let me ask that. Uh, before yesterday? Well, yeah, you said you mopped it yesterday. And then before that, when was the last time you mopped your floor? Yesterday. Okay. I can't remember the time before. Those black spots in the floor, was that the fecal matter? Could that have been the no. fecal matter that everybody was talking about? It's not feces. I mean, you testified as well that this was the cleanliness of the home and those photographs and the things that we're looking at today, that it was kind of a back and forth thing that for for a period of time, you know, your house looked that way, then you would clean it up and it would go back to that way, then you would clean it up. Is that what I'm hearing from you that you testified to? Usually it's very clean. Well, my question is, and I'm going by what you said, you, your terminology you used was back and forth. Do you remember that? Yes. When you say back and forth, are you talking about it goes from what we saw in the photographs to being clean, back to what we saw in the photographs to being clean? Is that what you mean by back and forth? Yes. 
So there are several times a year, depending on what time it is that you're, you're saying your apartment is, is clean, right? Yes. And there are times throughout the year, equal amounts of time that your apartment is not clean. It looks like those pictures. Correct. Not, a, not exactly. As dirty as those pictures were, that was the worst it had ever gotten. Usually there might be uh, two cups out or something like that. But I try to keep my apartment as clean as I can. But like I, I said before, these couple of months have been really difficult. You talked about um, not wanting to report Mrs. Tressler like for a dirty home if she was to have one that um, you didn't want to you know, get anybody in trouble, but you didn't want these hateful feelings is what I wrote down. Do you remember that testimony? Yes. Do you blame Mrs. Tressler for, for having an issue with the way your house looked when the police called her to come over there and get Elena because of all this? Not necessarily. Can I have a moment, Judge? Right. <clears throat> Does your brother work? I plead the fifth. So when Elena was there in the condition that that photograph, you know, showed today, how did she operate in the apartment? What was she doing? She was playing on her, her phone. She usually watches YouTube on her phone or she'll get on Messenger and she'll be on there playing Roblox with her friends. She just walk around the piles of that stuff and no, she usually she usually just sits on the couch. Doesn't really walk around. Nothing further. Peter Rock. Just briefly, Judge. <clears throat> Robert, <clears throat> you were just asked on cross examination about your earlier testimony. Um, you recall testifying when you first took the stand that your apartment, as it appeared in those pictures, was a one off. Do you remember? Yes. Is it your testimony that your apartment has never looked that bad? And that was a one no, It has never been that bad before. And the opposing counsel was questioning you on your testimony about going back and forth. Uh, explain that. I mean, maybe your apartment would get a little messy. Some laundry needed to be done. Yeah. Some dishes needed to be done. Yeah. You clean it. Mm -hmm. A couple weeks later, maybe some more dishes, more laundry. A couple weeks later, maybe some more. Yeah. But never that bad. No, it has never been that bad before. And as it exists today. Your apartment does not look like that. No. Is that right? Not, not nearly that. Okay. Judge, I have nothing further. Nothing further. You, uh, I know that you have some issues. Have you, are you receiving a disability payment? No, they, they stopped giving me disability about where was your, a year and a half ago. They where was your disability from? It was out of California. Because it was a state? It was a state disability. <clears throat> okay. And you no longer live in, Al in California, so they stopped your disability. All right. <clears throat> but that's the only type of disability that you've had. Mm -hmm. And then you, you are working now on uh, six days a week, essentially, and uh, making $15 an hour, if I understood correctly. All right. Yes. Um, I want to explain to you so that, that I know you, your lawyers probably also <laughs> talk with you about it. Invoking the Fifth Amendment is your right, but the Fifth Amendment is, a, is an amendment to the Constitution of the United States that says you have the right to not have to incriminate yourself in criminal conduct. You are charged with civil contempt, which is basically what your uh, former, or what the mother of your child is saying, that you have violated a court order and that you should be punished civilly, which means I could put you in jail for six months until you bring yourself into compliance with a court's order. Criminal contempt is that for every time you violate a court order, I put you in jail for 10 days. And that's the reason. I've told opposing counsel, it's criminal contempt for the contact with his brother, civil contempt for the child support. There's two contempt. Well, I'm referring to your uh, motion that you filed, motion for contempt and sanctions. <clears throat> and it says, you hereby move the court for an order holding the petitioner, Robert Allen Garvin, in civil contempt. And we show the following. That's filed January the 31st of 2024. 
Your, that's a misprint. I need to amend that. Number eight on there says I'm asking for criminal contempt, 10 days and all that. So I'll have to re revise that just to let the court know. I, I will be asking for criminal contempt on the contact part. I'm sorry, Judge. So I, <clears throat> I'm going by the plain language of the uh, introduction, and that's basically what it was. But so you understand, by, by taking the Fifth Amendment, you're simply saying my answers might incriminate me in some sort of criminal conduct. So you invoked your uh, Fifth Amendment, and I have to draw whatever I draw from that from that right that you've exercised. But I understand you want to see your daughter, but do you understand my only concern is your safety and well-being of your daughter? If I can sure that she's that she's receiving proper care, then I want you to have that visitation. But if I cannot be assured of that, or if you're not in compliance with the court order, if you're not going to comply with the court order, then that's going to have other sanctions. What I want you to understand is that <clears throat> the court order is not something you can simply say, well, I'm not going to abide by it this time. If the mother of your child if Ms. Tressler simply said, you know, I don't like the, act, the, the fact that he's got court order visitation this weekend, so I'm just not going to let her go, you wouldn't like that very much, would you? And you would expect the court to enforce that order, wouldn't you? And that would be by a finding of contempt. So what I want you to understand is, is that my job is to ensure the safety and well-being of your daughter, and your job is to follow the court orders and put your child's interest, your child's best interest first, above your brother. I understand you want to try to help your brother. But you got to put your daughter above your brother. I've got brothers, but I don't put them ahead of my, my children. My children come first. So you have that relationship, and I know you feel put upon that you're having to help your brother. But it's the most important thing in your life ought to be the safety and well-being of your daughter. And when I see those pictures that I've seen, you can understand you said it's a one-off, which I understand that's a lawyer. That's a term your lawyer has come up with for you to say that was a one-time only thing. <clears throat> I'm not sure I agree with that because of the simple fact that um, Sergeant Lashley came in and testified that uh, it was the same situation when he came to serve you with this restraining order. So you can understand I can only judge it by what I hear and what I see. All right, step down. Do you have any other witnesses? No, Judge. That any rebuttal proof? No, sir. <clears throat> Argue the case. I'll hear you in argument. Real brief, Judge. I... <clears throat> Is it brief by your terms or brief by my standards? Would they be different? I don't know. That would be a question. Subjective. Subjective. It is subjective. Subjective. Mm -hmm. Judge, um, this this apartment was neglectful it, it just gives rise to that that conduct that is correct by opposing counsel when he brought that up uh, miss Tressler's really struggling with this for one reason you heard her testify um landa loves her dad landa wants to spend time with her dad one of the reasons we've struggled in this case so much uh but this is an ongoing thing she testified to it's back and forth as he agreed with and we're trying to figure out and, and hit a spot here where where Elaine is protected yet dad gets to see gets to see her she gets to see her father um it's one of these things where what we would ask for is is for the restraining order to continue but uh work something out where maybe it's at the mother's discretion uh there's been no question at all about her discretion at this hearing and it wouldn't be if we had the final hearing i, I can tell you she could work this out where they could what have you set the uh other motion for contempt because of the TRO being set the way that it was I didn't have under the rules of civil procedure time to hear it <coughs> on today's date and it's set on the 26th of this month yes sir so it's set on the 26th and I'll amend that uh, that's that first paragraph definitely says civil contempt uh, but I, I would be asking for criminal on that um there's there's got to be a, a a happy middle ground here possibly where Ms. Tressler could be in charge of this thing and let her show you some good faith and move on through the 26 in the final hearing and uh, if we come here on 2026 20, I know this isn't his regular lawyer so maybe we can set it for a final hearing get this thing moved along a little bit but let her have a chance to show you some good faith to say hey yeah you can go see your dad let her have the ability to to walk into the threat and like I said not go through the through the drawers of everybody but walk through the threshold of the door maybe look okay fine you know have a great visit. John Gervin can't be around whatsoever, and he's pled the fifth now to a lot of these questions regarding 
the safety of her being around him. And it's very concerning that the apartment looks this way with him living there and that apparently he's drinking beer in the early morning hours, according to what the officer testified to, uh, because he was thirsty. And with his situation, that does not need to happen whatsoever. Um, what we do with that, I don't know. Um, I, Ms. Tressler can use her own discretion as to whether he's there, I guess, or, or whatnot, but they could do public park for a little while or you know go to school or do some things like that. Um, but there would be a, a significant problem with, with the brother. We need to find some reiteration that he's not going to be there. I don't think there's any question that he violated the order. He testified to it before we started pleading the fifth that you know the brother was there and around the land on that day. And what they testified to with the officer, I think, really sums that up. And it goes a little further with the trust issue, of course, with uh, Mr. Garvey. You can't be trusted. There is an order down that says you cannot have contact with your brother. He knew that. And as the court pointed out, it was an agreed order. He agreed that his brother was in a position where he shouldn't be around, you know, Elena at that time. And now here we are. And we all thought it was different. But when the police got called and they went in on a welfare check, you know, we have learned otherwise. I'm asking for, you know, this restraining order to continue. Let let the visitation be at Ms. Tressler's uh, basically discretion. And I can tell you, if you'll do that and get to the 26 and get to the final hearing, allow her to use good faith in, in letting them see each other. Because as she testified well, the to, twenty six is just your motion for contempt. That's not the final hearing, correct? It was not. No, sir. We have not set the final hearing. It's just the contempt on the contact and the contempt for the child support. He's a little behind on the child support. I understand he's got some checks today, and uh, he's going to give those up, and we'll take a look at those. But um, I think if you leave this up, basically the the end argument to Miss Tressler and the good faith of her being able to work out some visitation, I think you'll see that that'll work out. Maybe we get to the final hearing and be able to do some other things. Thank you for your time today. Judge, I think it goes without saying <clears throat> the least amount of drama we can interject into this case, the better off the child will be, the better off the parties will be. Um, in my experience in these domestic cases, Judge, whenever one party has what I'll call all the power or has the authority to walk through someone's house and says, no, there's a dirty coffee cup right there on the counter sink you need to wash that dish that's not sufficient for me so you don't get to exercise your parenting time having that authority invested in one party is wrought for abuse and oftentimes is abused in these types of situations uh, the father would oppose uh, vehemently uh, the mom having that authority now that's a different story if the court wants to order the father to provide her pictures of a clean house or a clean sink or a clean bedroom floor or whatever, I think that's sufficient. But having a party with the authority that can walk through someone's home and use her own subjective opinions to prohibit the father from exercising time with the kids, as both parties have testified, is in the best interest of the child anyways. The child being able to see mom, the child being able to see dad on a regular and consistent basis. Now, the pictures that you've seen, Judge, yeah, they speak for themselves. And the father has testified today that it's a, it's a one-off. His house has never looked that bad. But if you look at the written motion, Judge, the motion asks for the court to continue the restraining order until two conditions have been met. The motion specifically says that the, the restraining order they're requesting be continued until two, two things happen. One, the father is gainfully employed. Two, when the conditions of his apartment have been alleviated. You've seen pictures today, Judge. You've heard the testimony of my client that the apartment no longer looks as the way it does in those pictures that have been attached to the motion itself and entered into it, uh, evidence as Exhibit 1 or Exhibit 2. That condition's been met. And you've also heard testimony from the father that the second condition's been met. He's now gainfully employed. He's employed here locally, making $15 an hour with Midas, working six days a week while he can't see his kid, just got his first paycheck today. Got his first paycheck today and plans on grocery shopping when he leaves court today so that he can put food in the fridge and food in the pantry for the benefit of this kid. Judge, I, I don't believe that there exists any continuing harm to this child in letting this child go to her dad's apartment. The apartment is in much better shape. Dad testified to that. Dad provided pictures of the same. The conditions with which the, the mom has requested the restraining order be kept in place 
those conditions have been met. There is no continuing harm that would justify keeping the restraining order in place and prohibiting the father from exercising his parenting time. At the end of the day, Judge, I think everybody understands that you have to do what's best for the child. And I would submit to the court, Your Honor, that's what, that what, that's what is best for this child is that she is allowed to see her father on a regular basis, as she has been the last several years. It's my understanding this case has been pending since 2020 or 2021, uh, and, and going down the road to a final hearing, but, but cutting off all contact with Dad, all visitation with Dad, when there's really no true continuing harm here, doesn't serve the best interests of this child. Uh, Your Honor, we would ask that the court dissolve the order, of the not the order of protection, but the restraining order that prohibits dad from doing so. <clears throat> In such cases, the court's obligation is to balance the rights of the parents with the uh, best interest of the minor child, which <coughs> As I've stated more than once, the best interest of the minor child is always paramount in the whole story, as our appellate courts like to refer to it, of any custody case, of any custody decision. And certainly it is this court's primary concern is the best interest of the child. So what I'm faced with is <clears throat> a suspension of the previous order of visitation and rendering to Ms. Tressler the right to govern allowing the child to see the father or not see the, the father as she sees it might be appropriate. I don't really get <clears throat> that from her testimony that she's that insistent upon her being in control of it. I think she just wants her daughter to be safe. I think she, just, she wants her to see her father and I don't think she wants her to just be safe. And I've already made a statement and I'll make a finding that the conditions of the apartment as shown in these pictures and based on the testimony of not one but two officers on different days, the conditions of your apartment, Mr. Garvin, were unacceptable for a child of eight years of age. They're actually unacceptable for a grown man or two grown men to live in that condition. But that was your choice. Problem is your daughter doesn't have that choice. If she wants to see her father, she has to come into whatever conditions you have. And that means I have to protect her. <clears throat> so, um, the other option I have is to suspend completely the visitation um, based on a violation of the court's order regarding your brother. Um, but it is this court's opinion that this hearing is limited today to the extension of the restraining order. I'm not going to extend the restraining order. Instead, I'm going to put a new order down regarding that will govern how <clears throat> Mr. Garvin sees his children, his child, his daughter. He has right now Wednesday and Thursday of each week after school for a couple of hours, correct? Wednesday and Friday. Wednesday and Friday? Yes, sir. And that's, is that on every week or every other week? I thought I read that it was. It's, it's every week for the Wednesday and Friday, but if it's his weekend, he just keeps her till Sunday. Well, we're going to leave the Wednesday to Friday, um, but I want you to be able to, are you, uh, you coach, is that correct? Yes, sir. All right. Yes, are sir. You, are you, you don't have to stand up, you can sit down. <laughs> Um, when you are coaching, what time do you get through at school? You're at um, Creekwood? Well, I coach at the elementary school, uh -huh. um, but I coach track and field at Creekwood. So I leave Charlotte Elementary and go over to Creekwood. My practices are from um, four to six. Okay. So, and that's five days a week? Um, we typ I typically try not to do Wednesdays. But I'm at the mercy of the weather, so sometimes I have to, you know, cancel a Monday, Tuesday, or Thursday and pull up a Wednesday. All right. Well, look, we're going to allow Mr. Uh, Gervin to have the Wednesday afternoon and Friday afternoon okay. <clears throat> visitations. And second thing we're going to do is we're going to suspend the every other weekend visitation and instead replace it with every other Sunday okay. from the morning until, let's say, 9 o'clock in the morning until 6 o'clock in the afternoon. Okay. Um, Mr. Gervin, what I want is I want to give you the frequency similar to what you already have, but we're doing this to try to ensure that your daughter is, particularly, is, pro is properly cared for. This is conditioned on your brother having no contact with, I mean, she can, he can be gone. There's no overnight visitation. He can go anywhere in the world 
and be gone while she's there, if he still lives with you. Can't be around her. That is a court order. And when we come back on the motion for contempt, you're liable. You're probably going to be found guilty of violating it. <clears throat> but what I want you to do is to have the opportunity to provide a good home for your daughter and not one that she's going to grow up remembering how trashy her dad lived and what kind of a conditions is. She loves you. She wants to be with you. And she's willing to step over piles of groceries, of, of trash, piles of clothes, and live in a house there with you with little or no food. And she's willing to overlook the bugs that are there, the ashtrays or the planter full of, of ashtrays and things. I will say this. Somebody in your house had enough money to smoke a whole lot of cigarettes and to drink some beer uh, because that's what I see in these photographs. If you got the money to do that, but you don't have the money to provide a decent meal for your daughter, you are not much of a father. You understand that? You have looked after your own needs and your addictions more than you have provided a decent place for your daughter to see her father. And she wants to be with you. And that's the really the only reason I think that 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 I am inclined to continue the the frequency of these visits is because I know she wants to be with you. But if I find out when we come back on the 26th that you have violated this court's order one time, and I don't mean, no, I, I'm not going to listen to any excuses about Fifth Amendment in violation of Fifth Amendment rights and you're not going to, you know, you're not going to testify. If the proof is to me that you have violated this court's order again, I'm going to do whatever I have to do to enforce it. That means that you may go to jail. Civil contempt is I put you in jail for six months until you comply with the court's order. I can't do it but six months, but I can do it twice a year. You understand what that is? And I've put men in jail for not paying child support. You might want to think about that because somebody who comes before me that doesn't pay their child support is again a situation where it's a court order and if you're not if you're not in compliance with the court order then I have no sympathy for you. I mean I understand you've had a rough way to go and you've had some some problems. And I'm trying to help you and if you need to get help from whatever source uh, then you need to, to follow up on that. You can't just give up because you stayed on the phone for a long time. If that were the case, I, there are a lot of things I would have given up on when I been put on hold. I hate being put on hold, especially when they play the, that music that gets in your ear and you have to sit there and listen to it. I'm, talk about a psychological tor torture. That's pretty much it. But the fact is, is that's the only way sometimes you can do it. you got to persevere. So, what I'm telling you is this, I'm giving you the benefit of the doubt that this situation has been cleaned up at your house. But I want for the first time on Sunday, Ms. Tressler will deliver your daughter to your door. You will open the door for her. She will stand outside the door. She will look inside the, the apartment. And if it's clean and, and orderly, your daughter will go right in. She's not gonna know what you're doing. Don't talk to your daughter about, hey, if it's not clean, you're not going into your dad. I gotta take a look at it. Just say, I wanted to help you go see your dad, so I'm delivering you. Then you take a look at it. And if it's not in good, good shape, if it's stuff like this in these pictures, then you just get your daughter and go home. And then you tell your lawyer, and then we'll have Mr. Uh, Gervin uh, address with that. <clears throat> the point of that is not to allow her to control your life. It is for her to verify the concerns that both she and I have about the conditions in your home. Men aren't always good housekeepers. I'm not the best housekeeper in the world either, but I believe I could do a better job than that, no matter what the situation is, especially if you're not working. If you've got a brother that's trashing up your place, kick him out, get him to, you know, get him to go find his own place. I'm letting you live there with your brother if that's what has to happen, but I'm not letting you have overnight visitation because I have no confidence that you'll kick your brother out overnight, but he can be gone during the day. And I want you to understand, if he's around this child, I don't care whether it was fair or unfair that that agreement was made. It is a court order, and that court order will be followed, or there will be sanctions that will be imposed. Do you understand that? And the 26th of this month is when I have to determine what, if any, sanctions are going to be applied to you. I don't like putting people in jail for these kinds of things, but I have done it more times than I can count, and I will do it to you if you violate this order again. Do you understand that? Yes. All right. <clears throat> then I will uh, make that the order of the court. All the other issues are reserved for the 26th for the hearing on contempt. Uh, he will have the right to pick the child up from school as he's done in the past. If he's able to do so with your work, part of the reason I'm doing this is so you can work those six days that you've been talking about. And Sunday you're off anyway. <clears throat> so you can try to use that to catch up some of these 
child support payments that you may have been missing come into court on the 26th and you're current, guess what? It's not likely that you're gonna to go to jail. Come here on the 26th and you've been working $15 an hour for all of these hours and you haven't paid any child support, guess what? You're gonna to go to jail. So I just want you to understand the significance of what I've done today. Do you understand that, Mr. Gerben? I know you have a, a problem with a short-term short memory, but I, I'm concerned about the conditions in your house. And if, uh, if I need to send someone else over there to take a look at it, then I'll do that. All right, DCS has never responded to any of this allegation, correct? Understood, they may have talked to the young uh, Elena at school, but as far as Ms. Tressler goes, they, she's not had any actual contact, well, so I don't know what they're doing. And I say DCS is Child Protective Services now, I guess. Uh, Child Protective Services is you know, supposed to be following up on this, and I imagine there may be somebody that will just show up at your door one day see, and walk in your house whether you want them to or not to see what the conditions are. But you better make sure you keep it clean and neat. It doesn't have to be spotless, but it better not be in the condition it's in this time. Anything before then, we adjourn. No, sir. Josh, I'll draft the order and send it around. He's got about $1,200 in checks here and money orders for child support. Well, Okay. I'm not a collection agency. I, Mr. Holly can help you with that. So. I just want to pass these over to the opposing counsel for the presence of the court. So if there's any issues, come time for the, the civil contempt on child support issue with Mr. Barnhill. Everybody can be on the <clears> I don't know page. where you check to try to get yourself some help, but there are agencies out there that can help you. And, you know, if you need any, um, you know, you might want to, for example, the Help Center here in Dixon is one of the greatest institutions that, that we have in our county. <clears throat> I've gone there to buy stuff for myself, but you can go there and you can find what you need and you can get assistance from them at the Help Center. Um, and that would be something I would suggest to you if you start running short of groceries or things like that. So there are a lot of, a lot of uh, churches that will do that. So just don't give up because you get frustrated. You gotta go out go there and try to do it. What I want more than anything is for the two of you, Ms. Tressler and Mr. Gervin, to put your child's best interest first and set aside any kind of animosity or anger you've had towards one another and start thinking about how this affects your daughter. How does it affect your daughter that the police had to come to your house and have her removed from your house because of the conditions that you said were not acceptable? You told me that today. Think about how she feels about that. That's a memory that she's now gonna have for the rest of her life. And if you two can get along, then she can have a good life and she'll love both of her parents and have a good relationship with both. If you don't get along, if you get resentful towards her because she's trying to protect her daughter or if Ms. Tressler gets uh, resentful and tries to control the situation and harm you with keep you from seeing your daughter, if y'all have a lot of anger and animosity, then your daughter's life is gonna be ruined and every major event in her life will be a, a, a calamitous emotional trauma. Uh, whether it's a graduation from school, uh, Christmas, any other kinds of holiday visitation, graduation from high school, graduation from college, marriage. You know, she, I'd assume you'd like to be at your daughter's wedding and have a, a peaceful and harmonious and joyful occasion for everybody. You can do it if you two will get along. You also have to think about, from my standpoint, grandchildren. At some point, you're still young, but eventually you might have grandchildren. And if you do, the best thing you can do is to get along well enough so that you can both be involved in your grandchildren's lives and they can have a good relationship with you. <clears throat> my daughter's about to give birth to a, my seventh grandchild here in a little bit, and hopefully it all goes well, but I plan to be there for that. If there's any way in heaven or earth that I can be there, and I want to make sure that you understand that that's the kind of thing you can look forward to if both of you get along, okay? All right. I think you're both good people. I think you've had a rough way to go. And I think Ms. Tressler is a good mother who wants to protect her daughter. So let's try to make sure that this doesn't happen again, okay? All right, that's the judgment of the court. We stand adjourned. Thank you, Judge. Thank you. Judge, that's my motion for contempt. I believe the contempt is going to be stipulated to pass that for some oral arguments on what the uh, 
Um, so do you want to be on the second day. call, or are you wanting to do something about it today? I have two <clears throat> officers here today that if we're going to stipulate to the contempt, I can let those guys go. If we're going to stipulate to the contempt, then we'll put some oral argument in front of the court as to what to do for the My contempt. question is, do you want, to time, you want me to pass it on the docket to let you and your opposing counsel talk about this? We, we no, do, no. as long as we've got the contempt stipulated to, and I can let the officers go. That was one of the things I was trying to get those guys at. So in answer to my question, do you want me to pass it on the docket today to let you and Mr. Barnhill talk about the case, decide whether or not you want to let these officers go by stipulating contempt, and then we'll come back to it? No, Your Honor, we're ready to do that now. Ready to do what? Stipulate. All right. So are you ready for a hearing then after the stipulation of contempt? If we're going to have to do that for the sentencing, yes, sir. We may talk about that a little bit, see what we can do. Well, we'll put it on the second call and come back to you as soon as you two can figure out what you're going to do next. So, yes, but as far as the stipulation of contempt, it's my understanding, Mr. Barnhill, this is a stipulation that your client is in contempt of court. Yes, Your Honor. And is this a civil contempt that was so criminal contempt, Your Honor? It's a criminal contempt. The court heard a motion two about two weeks ago. They were calling a restraining order about the apartment. Officer Moss testified uh, about the conditions of the apartment. You made some rulings with her at that time. <clears throat> I hadn't had time to set the contempt, so it was set for today. So. Yes, Your Honor. I believe that the court heard enough testimony last uh, two weeks ago, and I don't think that there's any need to uh, to to rehash everything, Your Honor. Well, what uh, you and your client feel and what the plaintiff feels are sometimes two different things. Um, Mr. Gervin, I want to make sure that you understand your rights. So raise your right hand. Let's place you under oath. <clears throat> yes, I do. That's your full name for the record. Robert Allen Gervin. Mr. Gervin, you are here today charged with criminal contempt, and I want to make sure that you understand what uh, is the significance of that is. Do you understand that you are charged with violation of the court order and that that uh, violation is alleged to be criminal contempt? And if you are found guilty of criminal contempt, you are facing a sentence, a possible sentence in jail of 10 days for each and every violation of that order. Do you understand that? Yes, Your Honor. You understand that you have a right to plead not guilty to this charge and to have a hearing in this court where the state, uh, where the state, where the, uh, I'm going back to my criminal docket call, uh, where the plaintiff would be required to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that you have violated the court's orders and in a criminal fashion. Yes, Your Honor. You understand that if we had that hearing and I found you guilty, you could appeal whatever I did in your case in the way of imposition of sentence to the Court of Criminal Appeals. Yes. Or to the Court of Civil Appeals, actually, in this case. Yes, Your You Honor. understand that by entering a plea stipulating that you're in contempt of court, you're admitting that you're violating the court, and all we'll do is move to a <coughs> sentencing and whatever the appropriate sentence would be. Yes, I You understand all of these rights? Yes, Your Honor. We talked this over with Mr. Barnhill? Yes, Your Honor. Do you believe that you and he have discussed it fully and that you understand what you're doing? Yes, Your Honor. Do you wish to waive your right to contest the issue of your contempt and enter a plea stipulating that you're in contempt of the court's orders? Yes, Your Honor. All right. Then we'll move to sentencing. Have a seat. Thank you, Judge. Mr. Holland, do you wish to make an opening statement? Judge, contempt's already been stipulated to. Um, there's a hearing again that was two weeks ago. I'm sure the court's familiar with all the evidence that was put forth at, at that motion. Mr. Barnhill was not here. If you recall, he was sick and he had a, someone standing in for him. Uh, that being said, I mean, he's pled guilty to the, to the contempt and it was no questions asked. I mean, the officers came over and this minor child was in the apartment with John Gervin with a specific order down that says he was not supposed to be there uh, and wasn't supposed to be around the child at all. So we're asking that it be one contempt and 10 days of incarceration. If he still has his job, we have no issue with that being weekends or sometime that doesn't affect his job or some period of time that doesn't affect his job. But this case has been going on for some time with the issues that we've had and the court can look at the Look at the file until it's it's fairly thick. Uh, I think at this point we're we're okay to ask for ten days of incarceration, and and I think it it would be necessary for uh, him to to understand the gravity of that situation. I 
think the court can remember back to the to the hearing I don't think he really understood the gravity of the no contact order try to get into that some in the court uh, made it pretty aware to me that you know it wasn't a question of, of why that order was down it was a question that that order was down and whether or not he violated that order thank you Lord Hill do you wish to make an opening statement Your Honor, obviously my client is aware uh, and does understand the situation here. Um, we just discussed that uh, with Your Honor when you asked him, you know, if he understood what what he was agreeing to do when we stipulated to the contempt. Um, Your Honor, while this matter has been going on a while and it is a rather thick file, uh, the issues that have been that have come up have not been with non-compliance with orders. This is not a frequent occurrence. This is not something that has been brought to the court's attention multiple times. Um, instead, we have here, and what Your Honor stated at the last hearing was that we have um, a situation where a man has been dealt a, a very difficult hand, and the ways that he has. Uh, dealt with it have by no means been perfect, but we have a situation here where my client is uh, trying everything he can to be the best father he can for his daughter. Um, sentencing him to to serve ten days in jail serves no one here, Your Honor. Um, and he would it would restrict any time he would have with his daughter, which your court, the court found at the last hearing, not only is he a loving father, his daughter loves him very much, and the court stated repeatedly that it's important that he be around his daughter. Uh, sentencing him to serve weekends would, would take that away from him. Um, it would also restrict his ability to earn money. Um, I know that his ability to pay child support has been an issue before. Uh, there was a motion for contempt on child support. He's now up to date. Uh, so that was made moot, um, but since sentencing him would restrict his ability to earn, uh, which would further hurt his daughter. Um, Your Honor, I believe that it is in the best interest of the child in this situation that he, uh, he not be sentenced to serve time. All right, Mr. Holly, you may call your first witness. Judge. I'll call Ms. Dressler. Come around. <coughs> State your name for the court. Brittany Leanne Tressler. Ms. Tressler, you've had an opportunity to testify at the last hearing, correct? Correct. And you've had an opportunity to hear the, the statements uh, made today by myself and by opposing counsel, correct? Correct. And you heard the statement made by opposing counsel that uh, this was a, a unique type of event, that this was not something that, you know, was experienced on a day-to-day -day basis. What do you say to that? I disagree. Explain that to the court. Um, I mean, as far as what we're here for today with the brother, I mean, he's been around multiple times. Um, Object, Your Honor, that this is outside the scope of the contempt hearing. Uh, in the criminal contempt uh, motion, there's one allegation, and that's all that we're here to discuss today, Your Honor, is that one allegation of criminal contempt and any discussion of anything else is outside the scope of this hearing. Because it was not, my client was not properly put on notice in line with the rules for criminal contempt that anything else will be discussed. Uh, may I respond? It was his statement. I'm asking her to respond to his argument, counsel got up here and said exactly what he said. The issue's been raised by counsel argument, and uh, I will overrule the objection. It is for sentencing, and therefore rules for sentencing are a little more lax than they are for an evidentiary hearing on the question of whether someone is or is not guilty. So overrule the objection. Right, so you can answer the question and get into some detail about what you've experienced in the past. And again, not with everything, just with John Garvin being around your daughter that you know of. Um, the order was in place for him to not be around, um, and he was continually around. Um, even recently, um, we dropped her off on Sunday. Brother was there. Brother did state that he was leaving and put his shoes on to supposedly go to work. Um, but when I arrived to 
to pick Elena up, the car of the brother was still in the parking lot. Um, and Elena said that she sat in the car to wait for her dad to, I guess, go upstairs and try to make the brother leave. And this was when, just to be clear? Sunday. And this was after the last hearing? Not this Sunday, yes. It was last Sunday. This was after the last hearing? Yes. And did you, uh, like the judge ordered, did you go up to the apartment, kind of look in a little bit? And back yes, out? I did. Um, and it was, it was cleaner. They had shown progress of getting it cleaned up. Um, and the reason we chose to leave Elena was because brother was putting his shoes on and said he was leaving to go to work. And you took that for what it was worth? And I took their word in good faith that brother would leave to go to work. And, and once you, this was even after that last hearing? Yes. So you understand why we're here today. He stipulated to the contempt and we're requesting that he do 10 days of incarceration. Correct. And you agree with my statement that you don't have any issue with him arranging the time so that it doesn't affect his job or even his visitation? Correct. Why do you feel like it's important that uh, Mr. Gervin at this point uh, receive some incarceration for what he's done? So he can understand the extent of the situation. I am not. don't want him not to be around his daughter. They do have fun when they're together, but under the circumstances of the brother, I'm just not comfortable with her being around. And I don't think he understands the extent of that just yet. And what has Mr. Gervin said to you about the issues with his brother and being around your daughter? Has he ever expressed any concern to you about that? Yes, there has been times throughout that he has had concern of his brother's state of mind, especially if he is not taking his medication like he needs to. And the fact that this is in an order of no contact, uh, we, we had actually come to an agreement on that, correct? Yes, we did. We came to an agreement that the brother would not be around Elena. And that was your request and, and Mr. Gervin had agreed to that, correct? Correct. All I have. Mr. Barnhill, do you have a question? Yes, Robert. Concerning this bub, two weekends ago, you said that you dropped off your daughter and John was the brother. John was uh, putting on his shoes and he said he was going to work. Okay. Um, you decided to go ahead and, and Believe, you believed them and you left your daughter there? Correct. Okay. Um, and then you said you came back and his his car was in the parking lot and that, uh, what was it, your daughter said that she had to wait in the car. Uh, can you explain that a little bit more? I'm, I'm not quite sure I understood what, what it was that had happened. I was, before I even went to pick my daughter up, I mm -hmm. received picture evidence that his brother, his brother's vehicle was in the parking lot from who a friend okay uh who is this friend her name is robin she robin. lives in the apartment complex okay um so she sent you a photo of the car being there correct okay and asked me if elena was with her father today okay um and when you showed up to pick up your daughter was john there I did not see him. I was not granted access into the apartment, so I don't know. Um, it did kind of rub me a little weird because when I got there that morning, there was no problem with me walking into the apartment. And, you know, he was putting his shoes on, supposedly leaving for work. Um, but then when I got there and knocked on the door, it was being blocked by the door and I'll get her in the end. The, like I said, the car was in the parking lot, mm -hmm. and on the way home, um, I asked Elena, mm -hmm. what'd y'all do today? You know, did you have fun? Um, and she said yes, and, you know, I just simply asked her the question, well, was your uncle there? Um, and she told me that she had to sit in the car 
because dad had to go up and ask him to leave because he was there. Okay, but your daughter wasn't around him then? As far as I'm aware, no. Okay, so as far as you know, uh, Robert was in complete compliance with the court's orders? I would like to hope so, yes. Okay. Um, you also stated that uh, in the past, Robert had talked to you about concerns about his brother's behavior and mental health, mm -hmm. um, you know, specifically when his medication was off or something like that. Uh, did he ever explicitly state that he felt that Elena was in any danger or that John posed any threat to Elena? Honestly, I cannot remember. I mean, it's okay. it's been multiple times that we've talked. It's been, okay. you know, it's been years since we were together, okay. but there's always been concern of his brother. Okay. Okay, so those concerns, when you guys had those conversations, they were far enough, they were uh, distant enough in the past that you can't remember the specifics. So he hasn't, he hasn't expressed concerns recently then. There's been no express of concerns recently. Well, he agreed with me that she didn't need to be around him well, I think the unsupervised, fact that, well, so. I, when you say agreed with you that she didn't need to be around him unsupervised, you mean the he agreed to the order? Yes. Okay, okay. Um, but he did not express any statement to you that the order was necessary. Not that I can think of at the moment, no. Okay. All right. Uh, nothing further, Your Honor. You direct, Mr. Holly. Are you familiar with fact that John and Robert had gotten into a fight in 2022 during yes. the process. Your Honor, I think this is outside the yes. scope of redirect. Well, he kept asking about, you know, the, the issues with whether or not she felt like there were any problems at all with, uh, you know, John being around and any recent type problems. Prior testimony, the proof was that uh, there was some issue regarding the brother that caused both of them to be concerned, and that's why the agreed order was out. <clears throat> Beyond that, doesn't really matter. Uh, we have an agreed order that is enforceable by this court, and this is the sentencing for contempt. The reasons why they entered into that order are not necessarily uh, before the court because there's no motion to relieve or to change that order. So that becomes irrelevant as to what the reasons were and so forth. Yes, um, I recall what the testimony was at the prior hearing as to the reasons why, and you know, we just have, it's already been established that there was a court order down that he agreed to. He did not abide by that court order. And so the question becomes, what do I do about it? Yes. No further questions. Thank you. Do you have anything else, Mr. Barnhill, for this witness? No, Your Honor. Step down, Mr. Trustee. <laughs> anything else, Mr. Holly? Call Mr. Garvin. Robert Garvin. Garvin, if you'll come up, please. One moment, Your Honor. And you are Robert Allen Garvin, correct? Yes, sir. And your brother is John Garvin? Yes, sir. And you do understand why you're here today. You play guilty to contempt. Yes, sir. And from, from the facts that were in the contempt petition, you've agreed to those for the most part and played guilty. Do you understand that? Yes. All right. So, you testified last time that you were working at Midas? Yes. Are you still working at Midas? No. Why are you not working at Midas any longer? I'm having trouble remembering. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you testified last time that, that you were seeking veteran benefits for some of your issues, correct? Yes. And you, were you honorably or dishonorably discharged? Honorably. Okay, so you weren't dishonorably discharged from no. AWOL? No. Okay. Um, your situation with your brother, um, it's volatile at your apartment, correct? Your Honor, I'm going to object to relevance basically to all of this. I mean, you've, you've just stated that 
essentially the order the order was in it was violated we're here for sentencing <laughs> i don't know that the discussion is is relevant to this uh, what we're deciding right now what is the relevance mr holly I'll, I'll move on judge if it's not relevant. any objection all right um are you working anywhere now i'm currently looking for a new job by do do and scar and doordash whenever i have time uh, what else would you be doing with your time other than the visit that you got with your daughter that's it okay i go to work and then i come home go to sleep get up go to work and then i have days with my kid But sitting here today, you can't remember, from, I heard you right, you can't remember why you don't have your job at mine any longer? I think they were looking for somebody who was more experienced than I was, but that's my belief. You'd have to ask them why they fired me. Huh? Is, uh, is John Gervin, is he still living at your apartment? Yes. Is he still allowed to be around you? No. Well, he's not allowed to be around Elena. Okay. Were the bond conditions from the episode in August lifted where he can be around you? What What are you talking about? Do you remember you and Mr. Gervin, John Gervin, got into a got into a fight and the police were called and there were some bond conditions? Your Honor, same objection to Mr. Relevance. I mean, this... Yeah. Nothing further. Do you have questions? <clears throat> Mr. Gervin, do you understand um, what a court order means? Somewhat. Okay. You understand that if something's put in a court order that you are or not to do something that, that that's not optional yes okay and you understand that you have to follow the orders of this and any other court as it pertains to your behavior yes okay um and obviously here um you've already stated to the court that you did violate this this court's order correct yes okay um Do you have anything that you would like to say to the court as it pertains to that violation and your what we're here today for and your uh, perspective on this court's orders moving forward? There's a lot of things I'd like to say, but it doesn't seem like anybody's going to listen. Okay, well. We're listening right now. So if you want to say anything specifically about your actions and how you're going to act moving forward, um, now's the time. I want John, my brother, he will not see my daughter. He can't. Okay. So he has not been around your daughter at all since the last hearing? No. And the only reason why he was there the morning that they showed up on Sunday was because I never got any text. And I didn't know exactly what time they were going to be there. I was still asleep when they showed up. Okay. And when they showed up, uh, John left? He left. Okay. Um, and he was not around her, Elena, while, while you had her? No. Okay. Nothing further, Your Honor. Redirect, Mr. Holly. I don't have anything, Judge. <clears throat> Mr. Garvin, I want to make sure you understand, and, and I went over this with you before, but I want to make sure you understand it again. You understand that my job is to enforce a court order, and you understand that this order was something you agreed to through your lawyer. In other words, I didn't have a hearing, and I decided that your brother shouldn't be around your child. You and, your, uh, and the mother of this child agreed through your lawyers to that provision, that, uh, that he would not have any contact. It actually says absolutely no contact. It says it is further ordered to judge and decree that the minor child shall have absolutely no contact with John Gervin, the brother of the father. And you understand that? Did you understand it at the time? 
It was a difficult decision for me to make at the time when I signed that order. But you agreed to it at that time? At that time, yes. And, and you knew that that was going to be a court order that was going to be enforceable, I assume? Yes. Just like all the rest of the provisions of that order, which were the how often you got to see your daughter and everything else, right? Yes. Let's say I just decided that Ms. Tressel just decided she was going to stop you from seeing your child without a court or without having anything to do with a court hearing. She just says, you can't see her anymore, period. Would that be a violation of the court order? If it was in the court, yes. Yeah, I mean, if the court order says you get to see your daughter, it does, right? That agreed order. What if she just told you I'm not doing it anymore? It would be the same situation right. I'm in. What do you think should be done about it in that case? You think she would deserve some sort of punishment for not letting you see your daughter? No. You wouldn't, you wouldn't think she would. So she would be basically free to disregard an order and no punishment would apply. Is that what you're telling me? In a way, yeah. If my, if my daughter wants to be around her, I'm not going to stop my daughter from being around her mom. I can't. Well, now let's turn that around. If your daughter wants to be around your brother, there's a court order that says she can't. Are you going to stop her from being around your brother with this court order? It's a, a tricky situation. I mean, I understand what it's the not court tricky is. for me. Yeah. It's, it's written here in black and white. And unfortunately, I understand your situation. You've got a brother who needs help and you're trying to help him. <clears throat> and you're letting him live in your apartment. Do you remember two weeks ago or whenever it was we had the hearing and I told you you're going to have to choose between whether or not you're going to put your daughter's focus first or your son or your brother's <laughs> focus first? Your brother's an adult, right? Yes. So he could find another place to live if he needed to, right? He should be able to. I would, I would hope so. But everywhere doesn't. And do you understand that if you continue to violate a court order, you may not get to see your daughter at all? Yes. And you're still willing to take a chance on whether or not you're going to let your brother have a contact with your daughter? No, he won't. Well, I want you to understand that I take no pleasure in putting people in jail, but sometimes that's the only remedy I have to try to make sure people understand the significance of a, of a court order they agreed to. So do you understand that now? Yes. All right, step down. I don't need any argument in this case. By law, <clears throat> in a criminal case, a first offender, someone who has no prior criminal record, and it's the first time that they've offended um, in charge of that offense and convicted of that offense, they would be eligible for probation. A court order is a court order. You agreed to it, Mr. Gervin. You cannot, uh, in this <clears throat> situation, simply say, well, I, I agreed to it, but I had issues about it, so I'm not going to worry about it and let my brother around. The testimony that was at the last hearing was that you had your brother there in the apartment with your daughter when the police arrived for this uh, welfare check. And you've now admitted to that. So I find that you are guilty as you've admitted to your guilt um, for violation of the court's order. And I sentence you to 10 days in the county jail, but I'm going to suspend that. And the reason I'm going to suspend that is because it is a first time that you violated a court order. But every time, every day that you violate a court order, every instance, if you violate a court order five times in one day, you'll get 50 days. You see to your left, that lady that's sitting there in the pink. When I was practicing law, she had a woman that was uh, violating a court order and the judge gave her 60 days in jail, uh, 10 days for six different violations in a domestic case she'd never been in. And she was a former uh, army, I think an army nurse who had never served a day in jail. And that lady went to jail for 60 days. I tried to get the judge to change his mind. You know what he told me? 60 days. So what I want you to understand is, is that you may have a military background. You may have many things going on in your life that will concern you about what you should do. You have got to put your daughter first. And the first thing you need to do is abide by these court orders. If you don't like that provision, your lawyer, Mr. Barnhill, knows how to change that. You file a motion to alter or amend that order, have an evidentiary hearing where evidence is presented to a judge that will explain why that is no longer an appropriate provision. Then the judge makes a decision. <coughs> bound by that decision. She'll be bound by that decision. Um, so what I want you to understand is when you agree to that provision and that order, 
It became binding upon you and binding upon her. She can't ignore what those orders are by saying that she's not going to let you see your daughter. And if she did that, she'd be facing 10 days in jail for every contempt that she violated. But she hasn't done that. So I disagree that making you serve 10 days in jail at this moment is the best thing for you or your daughter. But what I want you to understand is, I don't, I don't know that you ever read any uh, history or any literature or anything. There's a, there's a famous piece of literature where it's described that God is holding people by a single thread over the bowels of hell. Well, we'll just put it in this term. You're being suspended over the bowels of the Dixon County Jail by a single strand. And that's that suspended sentence. And if you violate it one more time, you're going to serve 10 days in jail. And no ifs or nones about it. You understand that? I don't want you to serve that 10 days in jail. I want you to learn. But if you violate this court order, there is nothing that you can say or do that will make me decide not to put you in jail. It was just that simple. I don't want to do it. And if it happens, it will be your fault, not mine. It will not be Ms. Tressler's fault. It will be your fault. So shoulder that responsibility and make sure it doesn't happen. Do whatever you have to do to make sure your brother is not around until you can have a hearing before a judge, if that's what you want to do, to change the order. It's just that simple. But you cannot ignore a court order. A valid court order is enforceable, and I'm enforcing it. Do you understand this? Yes, Your Honor. Now, not only will you um, have 10 days in jail for this offense, if you violate the court order, as I say, you'll get additional 10 days for every time you violate it. So don't, don't put yourself in that position. Don't put your daughter in a position of having to tell her mom that, that your brother's been there and then you go to jail. What is that? How do you think that's going to make your daughter feel? So think about these things before you take the next step. I see no reason to make him serve a first offense violation of a, of a court order. Um, but I think I've enforced that sufficiently that he understands what happened one more time. He will go to jail for that 10 days and any additional 10 days the court seems to be appropriate. That's the judgment of the court. Um, we'll uh, put an order down, Mr. Holly. I will. Thank, Thank you. you, Judge. Thank you, Your Honor.